Hello, everyone, and welcome to Conceptualism. I'm very happy today to have with me um, a very uh, distinguished guest, Maestro Goslin, who is a famous and internationally renowned conductor, composer, <laughs> pianist, a scholar of music, uh, and uh, continues the living tradition uh, through his teacher, uh, and teachers of of the music of Beethoven, uh, and uh, and it's an honor to have you here on the show and to speak uh, to be speaking with you. So thank you very much, uh, Maestro, and welcome. Well thank, well, thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, I suppose when it comes to a living tradition and embodying, uh, uh, you know, a lineage, um, you know. Um, you you are you are in this you are in this tradition of what is called uh guru shishya where you know you you live with your your uh you live with your your guru your master your teacher and uh you know and they impart the tradition to you um you you yourself have have students apprentices um and uh, and you continue this tradition of of classical music um, that uh, has been passed down through your teachers. Yes, that's true. Cool. Well, that's that's remarkable because I mean you're able to trace your lineage as far back as as Beethoven and perhaps further. Well, actually, Beethoven studied with Haydn, so we could go back a little, one more one more notch. Which is yeah, which is incredible. I mean that 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 to me is just fascinating. Um, and, and I suppose when, it, when it comes to, when it comes down to it, um, you know, the people that, that study with you, they, they are representing you and they're, rep they're representing your tradition. So, you know, so there, there's a lot riding on that, you know, because it's, it's your name, right? Like, I mean, when, 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 a, when, a, yes. a, when a pupil, when a candidate is ready to, to, to go out into the world and to do what they're going to do, um, they are representing you and your school. Yes, that's correct. I, I when they're ready, I make a phone call and I give them an endorsement for a job, and usually get the job right on the spot. I understand. That that is yeah no that that is that is quite powerful. That is very powerful, in fact. Um, you know, in the Swahili language, and also in Indian culture, uh, there is this idea of placing yourself at the feet of your, your master, you know, in, in Swahili, they say shikamo, which means I place myself under your feet. Um, and, and the elder or whoever you're respecting will usually say, uh, you know, maharaba, which means I accept your, your, your respect. Um, so I think, I think in the Western music tradition, uh, you are, I mean, this, this is the, this is the legacy you are continuing, right? That, 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 yes that the knowledge has been handed down from master to apprentice and, and it's in this unbroken cycle, this chain, this lineage. Yeah, that's, that's true. So, so how does it feel to embody this, this tradition, this, this living tradition of, of, of music, of classical music? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's very humbling, but it's also a great honor because, you know, you're carrying out tradition. These men were all unbelievable geniuses and Indeed. musicians. And I have the responsibility of carrying this on to next generation. So it's something I take very, very seriously. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, quite. And and so perhaps then it would be uh, good to give give my audience uh, an idea of you know um, of what you said about how long it takes to you know to become a pianist. You know, you you said that you know you spend uh, you know. 40 years, 50 years to, to, to reach your, your zenith, your, your peak. And so then, yeah. you know, so then once you have finally reached your peak, you know, at the age of 50 or 60, then, then, you know, you hope that you have a few good years of, you know, of being at that level because it does take a lifetime to get there. Well, that's true. A lot of pianists performed into their eighties and nineties and even right. over a hundred was Oski toward, toward Europe at 101. Actually, my teacher, Played the rock mining off second at ninety three. Wow. So That's a lot, amazing. you know, it, it, it takes it takes a lot of growing and building. It not only as a musician but as a person. But I basically teach as something called the wholeness of music, what you are as a person, 
who you associate with, how you conduct your life. This is all part of who you are as a musician. And this goes into your interpretation, good, bad, or otherwise. Right. So you, it takes a very long time. I was, listening, I was listening to a recording that I made back in 1980. And it was nice, but I don't play anything like that anymore. Because in all that time, I, I've grown. And you, you keep growing. The thing about, thing about classical music, you can go back to the piece a hundred times. Every time you go back, you're going to find something new. You, know, you, you never reach the bottom of the well. I know Glenn Gould had recorded the, the gold variations twice. Yes, yes, he did. And, and both, and, and I mean, both, both were, were groundbreaking recordings in their own way. I mean, one, one, you know, really demonstrated the exuberance and virtuosity of youth. And then, and then his second recording, I think, was, you, you could call it like a, a master's statement. You know, he's like, he's looking, yes. he's, he's looking at it from, well, he has nothing left to prove. He's, it's, it's more, it, at this point, it's more, you know, the second recording is, it's for him in a way, right? Yes. Well, you understand when you're performing, you know, it's, it's, it's not a circus show. Yes. You know, I tell people when I perform that I'm practicing and I'm letting you sit in. I love this piece and I hope you're going to love it too. Rubenstein would single out one person in the audience and play just for that person. Right. 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 So, so it's, it's my, it's my, it's my duty when I start playing to have 3000 people or 3 million people or my audience that run between, you know, 10 people and 3 million to, to feel the same way. I love this work. And when they go out, they should, they should feel pretty much like about the piece. They should love the piece as much as I did. Right, right, right. And, and, if, and if, you do, if you don't do that, obviously, you know, people are not attending piano recitals anymore because of what's going on. They come out and they're no different than when they went in. And if they do that, they'll never come back again. Right. Right. I had a lady one time, I had a lady one time, I was playing in a, I won't say what city it was in, but I was playing, and she came up to me and said, you know, I really didn't want to come tonight. I bought the tickets, I had a bad day at work, I had a fight with my boss, I had a fight with my husband, I didn't feel well, the weather was lousy, but she said, when you played, it transformed me, I am so glad I came. Well, if nobody would have said anything to me for the rest of the night, I, I knew I did my job with a comment like that. She was the first one that came through the green doors in the green room. I said, well, thank you so much for coming. She says, my pleasure. She says, I'm gonna, I'm floating out of here. So if you know, if you if you you always listen to what your audience tells you in the green room. Yes. And of course, what the critics say is important too. But you know, the, the audiences are, are really the critics not paying the bills. The audience is the one that are paying you. They're they're your boss, so to speak. Because yes. if you don't do a good job, you get fired, and you don't come, you don't come back next time. So that's what that's what you basically have to do. So. When I'm playing, it's a very personal thing. I'm taking something that the composer has handed down to me. I'm putting myself into it. Music comes from the brain to the heart to the fingers. Mm. Now, unfortunately, a lot of pianists, especially the younger generation, forget that middle step. Right. They're playing all the, the well, Bach said to play music, you play the right note with the right finger on the right key at the right time. Mm. He was asked, that's how you play. Well, that's, that's good. But you understand playing the notes is only 10% of the piece. That's all, you know, you could teach your cat to play the notes. In fact, a colleague of mine had actually posted something on, on, on uh, YouTube. His cat's name is Nora. He had the cat play the piano. He hired a Hollywood orchestra and wrote a complete score to a company. It's called Cat Charitable. You can check it out on, on YouTube. And I think it's absolutely hysterical. The cat's actually playing the piano. <laughs> Oh, wow. and, he actually, and he actually orchestrated this whole thing and wrote it into a concerto. He sent me a link. Of it. It, was, it was very funny. Well, I mean, I, I always knew that cats could play jazz, but I wasn't so I wasn't so sure about classical music. But I guess I guess this 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 will this will well, this will be a, a definitive statement then. Well, yeah, any of you listening out there, if you want to look it up on YouTube, it's called Cat C-A-T Charito. Cat Charito. <laughs> that's hilarious. That's that's very funny. Um, yeah, well, and 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 I know I know that other animals, you know, have have shown an ability or a capacity to play music, uh, including elephants, uh, of course, chimpanzees and monkeys. I know dolphins have, yes. you know. Yeah. Uh, so 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 perhaps perhaps we're not as unique in our appreciation of sound and 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 of its arrangement as we would like to think. Well, I had a parakeet for years. Mm. 
and the verb was listening to me practice. And, it, and he was the verb was up on the third floor of my house. And if a student was playing, the student hit the wrong note, the, the bird would scream. He would he would chatter and that you you know tell me you played the wrong note. The bird would actually react that the note wasn't right. Wow, that's that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it was like this little green budgie parakeet who I had for years. Yeah. What was his name? Petey. Petey. So Petey, Petey. knew. He he knew when a, a wrong note was played. Petey knew if the wrong note was played, and he would do that screaming, you know, when the like, birds do when they get mad. <laughs> <laughs> so I told my students, I said, I said, even the bird knows you played a wrong note, you see. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my, my, my uncle had parrots at his, at his place, at his house, and the, the parrot would learn to imitate the baby. So, you know, the parrot would cry, the parents would wake up, think it was a baby, and <laughs> it was the parrot. Oh, dear. Well, that could be a problem. <laughs> No, this is this is a very important tradition, and unfortunately, it's dying off because the, all the great proponents of the, of the pianists, you know, the last one to pass away was Claudio Arau, and you know, all the all these other people have died, and unfortunately, the music schools these days are not perpetuating this tradition at all. Yeah, yeah. So so it's it's becoming more and more mechanical. You know, it's it's the, yes. The, the kids are learning how to play the right notes and to play them faster and more precisely and more fluidly. But what they're missing out on is the actual making of the music itself. Well, this is it. You understand? Every note has to come from someplace and go to someplace. Yes. A flat line, the patient's dead. You know, there's nothing. That's right. That's right. And That's right. It was Joseph Elsner, who was Chopin's teacher, that said every note must dance and sing. Hmm. Debussy taught his students to play on the piano without hammers. Wow. Okay. All right. And I thought I was eccentric. Well, Debussy, you know, Debussy is very hard to get right because it's impressionistic music. Yes. And one of the pieces I'm going to record this fall is the Sweet Bergamasque. And one of my students came to me and said, well, I don't like that piece. I said, well, who'd you hear play it? And he named the person. So I replayed it for him and said, oh, now it makes sense. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, I took, I took one of my young students to a Chopin recital. Right. He was new, he was new to classical music and we went. It was so boring when the men went to the restroom during their mission. They said, well, we're bored. I said, well, he didn't do anything. So we left in a mission. I took him back home and I replayed the whole first half of the recital. Yeah. Said, now I love it. I said, that's what Chopin's supposed to sound like. Well, you understand that people, the people that win piano competitions usually do not continue their career. You get two years of free bookings. But if you go play in the city and they don't like what you do, you're not going to write you back. Well, after two years, you run out of bookings and you're not re-engaged. Mm hmm. Well, that's interesting. That's very interesting, actually. I see now. That's 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 why I'm a little bit suspicious about about competitions and uh, whether they're piano competitions, organ competitions, even composing competitions. You know, um, but but some of them have quite sizable endowments or prizes attached to them. So well, well, this is it. Well, you understand a lot. That if you play two thousand right notes, you run over someone who played one thousand one hundred. You know, nine hundred ninety nine. There was a major pianist one time that walked off the jury because the person that should have won didn't. The competition sent me these videos, complimentary, and I will listen and pick the person I think should win. Uh -huh. And that's very rarely the person that ever did. I've judged in these competitions for 25 years because all they're doing is they want the right notes, but you have to have something to say to an audience. Right, right. If, I you, mean, have no, if, if you have nothing, if you have nothing to say, it doesn't matter how many right notes you played. Well, it would be like going to church and listening to a sermon, listening to a lecture, or watching a movie that was done in the monotone. Right. Exactly. You, you, would, you would be very bored. And that's what the music's basically doing. It's a flat line. The patient's dead. Nothing's happening. You get all the right notes, but there's no, nothing's going anywhere. It's sitting there waiting for a bus. Yeah. So it doesn't, it doesn't do any good. And no one wants to listen to that. So if they, if, they, if they go to your recital and you give them that, they won't come back the next time. Yes. Yes. I think you're, you're absolutely right. Um, well, look. So um, I was I was talking to Professor um, Hans Ola Eriksson, who is uh, the um, former chair of the organ department at McGill, and he said to me oh, yeah. that 
he he said to me that that judging uh judging these competitions you know in the first round he 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 had he had to be absolutely objective he had to just look at did they get it right you know objectively did they meet the standards then in the second round of the competition he would allow a little bit of subjectivity and but mo still mostly objectivity and then in the third and final round you know he would he would it would be completely subjective he would just you know, with his heart, listen to what 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 was being presented and choose what resonated with him. You know, and and so you know, I think that's also interesting because, you know, yes, well, the role that, that, that that's that, that's correct. That's correct. My my organ teacher Ray Ferguson was a student of Helmut Volker, the famous blind Bach expert. Right. So now, when I register an organ, I I register different than most organs. I reg I reg I register the organ orchestrally. Right. So when I when I play and we have a very you know we have a very large organ where I'm where I minister music, it's it sounds totally different because I I consider the organ my or the piano actually is an orchestra too. When when you play you know you, you should I ask my students when they're playing a piece I say okay what instruments are playing what what instruments are playing the right hand what instruments nothing okay that's an oboe and a viola but there's three voices that's a string trio. And I teach my students to listen that way to the music when when they study so they they start hearing orchestrally. Yeah, no, that that makes that makes sense. Definitely. I mean, the, the organ is more overtly orchestral than than perhaps the piano. Um, and and, well, you, you, have, yes. you have more choices of stops and so forth. Right. And in that sense, the organ is a kind of eclectic borrowing and amalgamated instrument, whereas the I guess you could say in, in comparatively speaking, uh, the piano is monochromatic. But there's there's a certain there's a certain beauty about that. I think it's like uh, Pierre Soulange, the master of black. You know, um, the, he's considered by many to be the greatest uh, living visual artist. And for 70 years of his life, he's just painted with black. And, and what, he, what he calls his style outre noir, beyond black. You know, so, so yes. he's not really painting with black anymore. He's painting with the way that light interacts with black. Yes. So you could, you could, you could argue that, that the piano is like that. You know, you're, 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 you know, yes, it's, it's one color, but you know, you're, you're not really painting with one color. You're painting with the way everything else interacts with that color. If you're a well, pianist, the, the pianist is not one color. It's many different colors, but you have to watch how you play. There's all kinds of shades of right. color you can do a piano. Right. But, and you know, and and any, you know, there's obviously some pianos are more capable of it than others. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, I mean, I've had a few pianos that. Well, left a bit to be desired, but you know, you still still get out of the piano what it's capable of giving. I have two fantastic. I have a nine foot Baldwin SD10, and a uh, six foot one conservatory choir in my home, and they're, they're marvelous pianos. And I get everything I want out of those. And when I tour, of course, I use Steinway, and I always have a nice concert, nine foot concert grand. Yes. So, so then perhaps, perhaps on the on the fickle idea of piano makers, do you do you indeed? Uh, you know, um, I mean, obviously you're endorsed by Steinway, um, and and that's you know, that I understand that. Uh, but you know, do you do you have a preference? Like, do you know, if if you had a choice, would you you know, would you rather play you know in a concert, depending on the repertoire, obviously, uh, you know, um, a Fazioli or a Busendorfer or you know, um, a Baldwin or 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 any other piano, you know. Apart from apart from a Steinway, I understand that Steinway is is you know uh, an incredible piano, but you know are there particular maybe repertoires or particular spaces where you feel that I don't know you could benefit from the extra keys on a on a Busendorfer in the bass? Well, it's fun if you play the Hungarian Rhapsody an octave lower. The last four pages sounds like a thunderstorm. Right, 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 right. right. Well. And, you know, Steinway is a high tension instrument. And the reason Steinways are used because they carry in the hall and they carry over an orchestra. If you yes. put a ball or a Busendorfer in there, you're not going to hear it. Right. So the Steinway has that purpose. But if you're in a smaller hall, then a nice Busendorfer, a Blutner, a Beckstein. Now, of course, the new ball ones are made in China, so they sound like a Chinese piano. Right. They no longer sound like ball ones. Right, right. But the SD, the SD10 I have is from 1973. I think it was the best one ever made. I played that piano when I was an undergraduate student. Of course, I couldn't afford it back then. And then years later, it showed up and I bought it. Yes. But it's but no, it, it depends what what the repertoire is. I mean, if you're playing French repertoire, well, the Playel piano would be nice. You know, that's very good for French music. They stopped making those recently. 
But Baldwin's very nice, but you couldn't put a Baldwin in the hall and play the Rachmaninoff third on it, for example. It just, it just wouldn't work. Now, it was um, uh, a lot of uh, Liberace used Baldwin. Right. Uh, Leonard Bernstein used Baldwin. Claudio Rao used Baldwin. And, and, and they work quite well. But again, if you're in a large hall, if it's, especially if it's a dead hall, and you've got, you got, you have to have something that, a lot of, when Bösendorf came to this country, a lot of the orchestras bought Bösendorf. Right. And unfortunately, they, they had to use them for other purposes because it would not carry. A Bösendorf, you can play it and you reach a point, you hit the wall. Because mm. I played a lot of Bösendorf when I was in Vienna. Steinway will keep going. Now, of course, you, you get to a point, even with a Steinway, you need to stop because it sounds like 2,000 coat hangers being thrown against the wall. Right. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're no longer making music. Mm. But some, you know, and in this the action, you know, I like the, I like the SD tens because they have a Renner action. I prefer the Hamburg Renner action for Steinway over the New York action. Right. It's much, it's much easier control. And Fazioli is a very fine piano. Yes. So, but again, it's you know, if if I if, if I'm choosing a Steinway and I go to a city, I'll go through five or six pianos to choose the one I want for the program that I'm playing. Of course, of course, and 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 as a as a Steinway artist, they, you have the privilege of doing that. You can choose your the piano that you want to play on. When I went to Steinway Basement, you know, in New York, I mean, you have ten, you have ten or fifteen pianos, and in fact, I didn't find any of them that I wanted. And Clay Blackburn, who was head of the CNA back then, she said, "Well, go over to Carnegie Hall and play the one on the stage there." And I did, and that's the one I ended up using. Right. So you have to pick the right piano, but you know, when sometimes when you go in, you don't have a choice of piano. You use the piano whatever they're offering you. Yes. And you have to and you have to make the very best out of it. I remember one time I gave a concert in Maine and the audience arrived. I arrived, but the piano didn't. There was a there was a foot and a half of snow that day. And it was in a it was in an old theater. And the only piano they had in the back it was an old uh Renal upright that was painted fire engine red that they used to use for the dance lessons. Well, fortunately, it was in tune, and I played the entire recital on that. Wow. So, yeah, you I didn't, sort of have to adapt. Well, yes. Sometimes I, you know, sometimes when I go into churches to play a wedding or something, sometimes the church piano leaves a lot to be desired. But, you know, you just do the best you can on what you have. I, I, I can try to, I can get them, I try to get the most out of everything I can possibly get out. I understand. I, I do understand. Um, but you see, I mean, this, this, is, this is one of the reasons I think that Cameron Carpenter created the International Touring Organ, because he didn't want to have to contend with, you know, with each different organ and, and to contend with the, you know, the acoustics and all this kind of stuff. But he wanted an instrument that would be adaptable to any space and that, he, that was his own, that he could call his own. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess like having your own piano and having your own organ, I mean, these are... These are luxuries that not every pianist or, or organist can can claim or, or, or have, you know, have the yeah. capacity to, to have. And so, yeah. you know, so unfortunately, sometimes, you know, you're in a place and there, you know, the instruments that are available are far from they leave a lot to be desired, but you have to make the best of them. You have to make the best of the situation. You know, it's like having a bad dance partner, but you, you cannot make it look like they're a bad dance partner. You still have to make it look graceful. Well, this is it. Well, I'm fortunate. I also have a Rogers 505 organ with three sets of pipes in my in my dining room. So I actually have an organ at home I can practice on. Wow. Okay. So you have a practice organ. Yes. Well, it's, it's actually came from a large church. It's it's an actually equivalent to about it's actually equivalent to about 35 ranks. It's pretty good size. Wow. It's pretty good size. So so so, so but but you said only three ranks are installed in your in your uh well okay so it, it's a digital sample organ. Ah, uh, okay, 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 fine. I see. Okay. Now, now, now what I did. What I did, I took I took the two cabinets and I put three ranks of the old con electronic pipes on there, okay. which really enhances the sound. I see. So is it a, is it a Hauptwerk organ then, or or is it or is it or is it just a a, a Rogers console with with Rogers sounds? It, it's a Rogers console, and it's it's equivalent to about it's about thirty about thirty eight ranks of pipes. I mean, is what I see. But, it, but it's very it's very nice, and it's a it's a great practice organ. Right, right, right. Well, you know, I, I, I've, I've always admired, I mean, very, very, I mean, I mean, the price point of, of Marshall and Ogletree organ, obviously, as, as, as you know, is, is, is much more than a Johannes or a Rogers or, or an Allen or any oh, yes. other organs. But, but let me tell you, the, the, the Marshall and Ogletree, those are musical instruments. 
Where, whereas whereas the Rogers and the Allen and the Johannes there. Well, I'm not, actually I'm not going to comment about that, but but because I might upset some people. But what I all I will say, all I will say is that you know if if you if you encountered a Marshall and Ogletree in a, in a conservatory or a church or a or a concert hall, that 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 is an instrument that 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 really speaks that has it that has a a voice that can be contended with and understood uh in in the same you know with the same seriousness as some of the great pipe organs because they've taken the time to really make it an audiophile experience um so you know in the building in the building of my own personal instrument a custom musical instrument you know um i i i think you know the the first priority is of course the, the fidelity of the sound because in in right. that I mean in every other way I I you know I I'm the furthest thing from a purist. But when it comes to sound quality, oh I I my standards are are almost impossible. You know I because I I have very good hearing and 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 perfect pitch. So so when I when I hear something I can tell you you know this this is what I want or it's off by this much or you know I I can tell you you know even in microtones because I study classical Indian music I can say it's a mic it's you know it's a microtone off. You know, so, 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 so in, in, in these kinds of contexts, you know, when I listen to instruments, even, even, you know, even some of the finest instruments and they're, and they're off by a little bit, I can say, okay, this is off. Um, but of course, you know, I, I tend to use that, like, you know, how Art Tatum would use a, a, an out of tune piano to, you know, to, to, to create all kinds of fascinating effects that did not sound out of tune at all because of the context that he placed the notes in. Um, you know, I, I think it's the same thing with an organ that, for example, you know, if you want to create uh, an imaginary stop, like a 10 rank you know, uh, a string, a 10 rank string, for example, you know, uh, which has been done on the international touring organ that doesn't exist on any physical instrument. Uh, no. But you know, you, you can you can basically create layer upon layer of, you know, uh, flat, flat, flatter, flatter, you know, uh, you know, rank and, and sharp, sharp, sharper, and eventually, you know, uh, you know, you're creating sounds that are so rich and textured, you know, it actually sounds like a string section, and it's just one stop. You know, like a choir. It sounds like a choir. Like, you know, you can have a, a choir of, you know, a stop of Vox Humana that has ten ranks. You know, that doesn't exist. I mean, that doesn't. That kind of stuff doesn't exist. But, but really, oh, if you're creating a digital instrument, you can work in these kinds of, you know, uh, hitherto unexplored realms. Things like 128 foot stops, 256 foot stops. You know, uh, th th infrasonic and subsonic stops. Th things like that. Things that are really fantastical and in the realms of imagination but you you know you can realize them with with a digital or 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 hybrid instrument well i have a i have a rogers 885 a church that was custom designed for the church and it's got a million cabinets right and i had and i had two major organ department chairmen come and play those organs and they said this is the most fantastic thing you cannot tell the difference when i have organs coming okay where are the rest of the pipes they're looking all over the church trying to find the pipes because it really does, and the, and the good news about that is you don't have to tune it. Yes, 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 yes. yes. The, the, the building I'm in is very hostile to pianos. I, I would be tuning the organ every day. Yes. I mean, I have a, have a hard enough time keeping, fortunately, the, fortunately our church pianist is a piano tuner. Mm. So every Sunday he comes in and he's touching up, he's touching up the two bands in the sanctuary before the service. Because, that, and, and the nice thing about that is there's a pitch variance on it too, so. If something happens, you know, you, you have to change the pitch. We had a bagpiper come in. Of course, the bagpiper doesn't play 440. He was up a quarter of a tone, so I was able to put the organ up so it didn't sound like a calliope when I played with him. Right, right, right. And that's one of the advantages of, of a digital instrument. Although there are some there are some physical pipe organs that have the capacity to do that kind of tuning now. Um, I, I played I played one in a in a church in Toronto where you you could you could actually move the the organ up and down by microtones and and of course you had a transpo a transposing function where you could move it up and down, uh, you know by uh, quarter tones by semitones by whole tones whatever you want, um, okay. up and up and down which which I think which I think is is great because there's a lot of computer technology that's now entering the world of uh, physical pipe organs, e even the, the organ at Notre Dame in Paris. I mean, that, that, that organ it has a, you know, it's basically a, a computer. I mean, it'll, it'll remember, you know, hundreds of thousands of combinations. It'll, it'll remember registrations, you know, it presets combinations. I mean, it, right. it's, it's, it's basically a, a supercomputer, but, uh, but it's, it's controlling all these physical, you know, 
pipes that were designed and built by Caballero. Right, exactly. You know, which is in which is which is completely opposite from Sanskrit piece, which, as you know, is a, is a, is a completely mechanical instrument. It's five manuals, but it's it's completely yeah. mechanical, and it, it it has very few assisted uh, assisted devices. So you know, you need multiple people to 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 deal with the registrations. Yes, yes. My my first church I had had an eighteen ninety one Johnson tracker work at thirty five ranks with a metal pedal board, straight board on, and. You had to have people on each side. That if, I, if I was playing a front corral, for example, I had to have two stop pullers to, because there's no way, you know, you have to be yanking these drawbars in and out, to, you know, to, to make all the changes in the front, like for the A minor corral, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you told me that your leg muscles were 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 extremely well developed because of that. That pedal board was so stiff, I almost had to stand up to play it. It was that bad. So I had extremely, I still to this day have the strongest leg muscles probably of any organist on the planet. Just playing that organ Sunday after Sunday gave me plenty of exercise. Well, that's, that's, that's really funny. Well, there you go. So you got, you got your workout, you got your, your physical workout while you were doing your, your, your emotional and mental workout as well. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, I wanted to ask you about the Russian school of music and particularly about uh, composers like uh, Tchaikovsky and that whole school. You know, um, okay. and and you know, and about Russian, I guess you could say orchestras and conducting and and pipe organs, like like the you know the one at at um, at the the hall, the, the grand hall of the Moscow uh, Conservatory. Moscow Conservatory. Yeah. Moscow Conservatory. Yeah. Well, you know the Russian the Russian orchestras are absolutely phenomenal. You know the Marinsky Orchestra has put out recordings of the, of the Tchaikovsky Symphony, which are absolutely phenomenal. Yes. I mean, I mean, the you could, argue, the you could argue that they're they're the authority on on. I mean, not not just in terms of technique, but just just in terms of sheer, you know. Yes. Yeah. The, the, those recordings. I mean, my my I mean, my favorite, you know, non-Russian conductor is Carlos Clark, because you know when he does, he didn't record much. What he recorded was absolutely incredible. It's like listening to the work for the first time. Right. But the Russian orchestras on Russian music. I mean, like Marinsky and some of those. Those set the standard for the industry. You really cannot improve on those. Right. And, and being a conductor myself, and I, and my, my, in high school, I studied Russian harmony under a Russian who actually used to, who actually came over during the Russian Revolution and played in the Moscow Orchestra. So when I studied the Russian harmony, I got the real McCoy. He did it in Russian on the board, on the blackboard. That's how we learned it. <laughs> yes, and 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 you are a polyglot. I mean, you speak a, a number of different languages. Yes, I do. I, I can, I do. So when I travel, I can get around them. When I went to Vienna, I mean, my, my German was so fluent, they thought I was born there. I mean, nobody ever questioned anything I said. In fact, in fact, when I was, when I played for them, they, 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 okay, where do you live in Vienna? And why don't I know you? I said, when I told them I was in Detroit, Michigan, they couldn't believe it. They said, no American could ever play Viennese music like that. So when I told them that my teacher studied with Emil von Sauer, of course, which is their most famous teacher, then everybody put two and two together. Right. Right. They said this is this is perfect Viennese style. It doesn't oh. exist anymore. So I they told me. In fact, I I'm I'm sure I still have a job offer there to teach if I so choose. I, I love that city. It's the most you know. It's my favorite city. That city is music. It is. No, it it really is. I mean, um, no, it's fascinating. And and in fact, the UNESCO uh, Intangible Cultures listed it as as a as one of the cities that has the the richest intangible culture. And among among um, among I, I believe it's among the top three cities in the world to live in terms of the quality of life. So so yeah. Yes. So I but I do my my style is the Viennese style because my teacher first of all he studied under von Zauer, then he studied Chopin and French work under under Alfred Cortot. He was also a student. Of course, Cortot was the absolute Chopin expert. Right. So, so when I play Chopin, it's probably, I'm sure it sounds, people say it sounds a little bit like Coteau. Mm -hmm. And then I play, when I play the, the German classical, it sounds like, when Zawa made a recording of the Mazeppa from the Transcendental Etudes of Liszt on YouTube, which he it was at the piano roll, but that will never be equal. Right. I mean, it, it is beyond belief. Yeah. It is just, you just, you could not improve on it. You just could not. Well, you know, um... I think it was Rubinstein uh, who said, you know, of Art Tatum, that if if he decided to take up classical music, that he would instantly hang up his coat. You know, there's a famous there's a famous story, of you know, of him, um, 
you know, uh, uh, wait, am I am I getting the pianist's name right? What? Well, I think so. The... I think so. Um, so anyway, so so uh, uh, so so you know, um, art. Uh, so he so the uh, so he writes this this incredible you know uh, transcription or not transcription but uh, variations on T for two, which as you know was was um, you know Art Tatum's just most brilliant piece uh, that that he ever recorded. Uh, so he, he he wrote this fiendishly difficult you know series of variations on on T for two, which he he then went he went on stage and played for Art Tatum. Um, and Art Tatum said, that's very nice. And then he sat down and just played T for two. I mean, just wasted the composition, just played and played and played and played. And, and you know, and it, it had taken, it had taken the, you know, the Rubenstein, I think uh, a month and a half or two months to write this, you know, these, these, these incredibly, you know, virtuosic variations. And so he asked Art Tatum, when did you figure this out? And Art Tatum just said, right now, you know? So, so, so I think it's, it's fascinating that, you know, that, that, I mean, if if Art Tatum had decided to play classical music, I mean, well, well, he's already, yeah. he's, he's already considered the greatest living jazz. I mean, the, the the greatest jazz pianist ever, you know. And and I think it was an MIT student who who named the the smallest interval in musical time the Tatum in his honor. But I mean, look, if if Tatum had decided that he wanted to do classical music or to be a composer, I mean, I I think, I think it would have been very difficult to rival him. Um, I mean, the only one person I can think of that really, you know, uh, could perhaps go head to head with 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 Art Tatum and 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 maybe hold their own would be maybe Martha Argerich. You know, she kind of plays with the same, I guess. Fluid well, yeah, she style. does. She does. She does. But you know, improvisation is that's a nineteenth century. To, uh, when I when I close my recitals, yes. I ask the audience to give me a melody and I write a composition. Well. That's not done anymore. In fact, with the level of theory teaching in the colleges these days, I'm not sure it could be done these days. <laughs> because I mean, I, when, when I when I teach my students, when I, I take my young apprentices start about 13 years of age. Okay. And by the time they're 18 and I send them to college, they, they completely by examination skip the entire undergraduate theory department. Because they're all they're already up in the they're already up in the piston orchestration by the time they leave me. And the faculty looks at him and says, well, there's nothing I can teach you. You've got 100% on every test. Right. So I, then they just have to go on at that point because I teach, I actually do, well, I'm a retired college professor. 28 years I was at the Oakland Community College. So I, when I teach my students, the time I'm done with them, they're actually up to that level. In fact, one of my 17-year-olds was, was a published composer at 17. Hmm. And then there was some Memorial Day uh, I had some concerts that were being given on the local radio station. And he's 20 now. And he actually wrote all the music for that and actually sold commercially. So theory is very important. You can't play the piano with, unless you know your theory because you, can, you can't you have to play the piano with intelligence. You have to know the structure of that piece. And it's like trying to read a try, try, trying to read a book and you don't understand the grammar of the language. It, it's impossible. Right, right, right. right. And I mean, and I, you know, and I encourage, uh, and a lot of a lot of private teachers, you know, we, you realize a lot of our major conservatories no longer even teach scales or technique with the piano work, none, hmm. because no one's hiring their graduates. You know, last year they graduated four thousand piano majors. The national hiring average was one in this country. That was the, that was our award. And organists, those they only graduated three hundred and fifty six organists last year for the whole country. That was it. No, no one's taking organ. The colleges are getting rid of the organ departments now. No one's right. taking organ. Right, right. Well, what what are your thoughts about Juilliard and uh, and and the organ program there that I believe is headed up by uh, Jacob? Paul oh, Jacobs. That's well, right. I well I understand it's very good. I mean, I haven't I've never heard anything bad about. It. I don't know Paul Jacobs personally, but I understand that you know Juilliard made its name, of course. You know, was training violinists. You know, when right. Dorothy Delay was, when she was there, she trained every major violinist that came through. And of course, back in the old days when the Levines were there and so forth, they had a you know marvelous piano department. Yes, 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 yes. Well, but, you know, but, it's it's interest it's interesting because, um, you know, I, I when I reached out, I reached out to a number of you know departments at a number of universities, saying you know, look, this this I I actually the the reason I reached out was to you know, to share that I was developing the infinite sonic possibility interface with Marshall and Ogletree, uh, and and kind of you know giving them a synopsis of what that was and what that meant, um, 
and so Paul Jacobs said, you know, you he basically gave me an invitation to come study with him and in his organ studio uh, at Juilliard. Okay. And uh, you know, I, I've received similar invitations from many universities, actually, um, and in, including in, uh, in that, I would say Ivy Leagues and and some very prestigious teachers. Uh, but I I have found that that I have not taken any of those offers, and that I prefer. Uh, to be an autodidact and to work, at, I guess you could say, as an insider's outsider. You know, I, I formally collaborate and, 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 and am mentored by many people, you know, the top men's in their field, but I retain, I guess you could say, my independence, um, you know, which, which to me is incredibly important because I don't want to sound like anybody else. I don't want to sound like any school. I don't want to, you know, I, and this, this is going to sound a little bit arrogant, but I, I want to, you know, I want to start my own school, you know, I want to be an institution unto myself. And in order to do that, I have to learn and, you know, understand all that has come before, but, but then, you know, create my own thing. And so you have to be, I guess, very guarded in, in, in then making sure that you don't, you, you don't appropriate or you don't sound like you don't start to sound like anybody else. So I've been, I've been, it's almost, it's almost sacrosanct, you know, in, in that way, you know, I don't allow my, I, I try to keep it unadulterated, my practice. It's very difficult, but I try, you know, um, and, and so, yeah, so, so I've rejected, you know, many offers to, to study. Um, but, but I do study every day and I, and, 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 you know, and I try to, you know, I try to understand all these different schools, you know, wh whether it's the Viennese, whether it's the Viennese school, whether it's the German school, whether it's the Russian school, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to take these best practices, you know, um, but to shape, shape my own language and my own vocabulary that, that, you know, stand on its own. And, and as part of that, I don't play anybody else's music except my own. I, I only play my own original compositions and improvisations. I do, I do not play uh, in public, anyway, I do not play any other music. Like you, you will never hear a recording of me playing Bach or Chopin or or anything, frankly, that resembles any any anybody else's music. It's all my own original compositions, uh, unless I, I I suppose I get commissioned to you know to rearrange or transcribe or you know something for an institution. They'll say, okay, you know, we want you to play this, you know, and we're paying you to do it. Fine, you know, I'll I'll give them my version of it, but it's on my terms. You know, I'll I'll do I'll do what I want with it. Um, but basically, to, to me, retaining that 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 purity or that fidelity is very important. Um, and I, I I don't know how I don't know how that is looked upon uh, within the world of classical music because I know I well I know I know that people have outright rejected my way of thinking or 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 or, or said that it's blasphemous or that you know you know how how can you how can you you know not embody a tradition how can you not you know uh, want to sound like X, Y, and Z, you know, why, why would you not play Bach? You know, you know, you must not be capable that, that, that I've gotten questions like that or answers like that. And my, my response to that is to then improvise a perfect fugue in, you know, in atonal and tonal, you know, uh, 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 you know, language. But, but I think, I think, I think as a, as a composer, as a musician, if you're going to stand on your own two feet and you're going to prove that you can, uh, then you have to, Respect everything that has come before, but build your own thing, build your own building. Well, everybody has to, everybody makes their own choice. That's right. That's right. I think you're right. Everybody makes their choice. Yeah. They decide where they stand. Well, because, you know, you, you would never get two pianists to agree on anything, frankly. <laughs> yeah. How many pianists does it take to change a light bulb? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Probably 242. <laughs> And then, 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 and the one who did it would be criticized because he did it the wrong way. And so, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, everybody, everybody has their own choice, but the, the ultimate, the ultimate thing is, the people that you are submitting it to are either going to accept you or reject you. Yes. Now, if you, in the, in the, and if everybody rejects you, you're going to have to go into plumbing or something because you're not going to be able to pay the bills. Right. Right. Well, see, now that's that's where I've been lucky. I, I, you know, I've, you know, I, I've done work. I've done work for and with the Aga Khan Museum, with with a number of other institutions. I get commissions all the time, uh, you know. Sure. Like and and so look, I'm very lucky that that. Well, I well, actually no, I'm not going to call it luck. I've worked really hard to earn the privilege to you know, to to do my own thing and to and to have that respected. You know that that didn't come easy. 
believe me, I, I had a lot of a lot of haters. I mean, that one one person. I'm not going to name their name, but uh, one one person even went so far as to say that you will never amount to anything. He actually publicly said that. And then in, in response, a month and a half later, I presented a sold out concert at the UNESCO World Heritage Site in, in, his, in the town that he, he lived in and invited him. Of course, he didn't come, but the rest of the town was there. And then I got an interview with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation because of that. And, and basically, I, I said, you know what? You, you told me that, that I would never amount to anything. Well, here, here it is under your nose in your town with your... You know, your people recognizing me and acknowledging me. So deal with that. You know, uh, so, so whenever, yeah. whenever, whenever I've dealt with that kind of, that kind of bullying or, 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 or intimidation, th those kinds of tactics, those scare tactics, you know, my, my response has just been to do what they're doing, but to do it 10 times better and then say, okay, now argue with that. Well, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's right. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's why even the idea of judging competitions is, is so difficult. You know, it's like, you know, it's like what, what one, what one judge decides or what one jury decides is very different from what another judge and another jury would decide. So, you know, a winner of one competition might not have won if it had been a different jury and a different judge. Uh, well, different, yeah. well, well, that's very true. When, when I judge a competition, and, you know, I pick a winner, I want to make sure it's somebody that's saleable. Right. You know, it, it doesn't do any good to spend, you know, $120,000 for you know, degrees in college and end up working at McDonald's because no one's going to hire you. So I, so I have to be very sure, I make very sure that what that person has to offer would be saleable in this day and age. Right. I understand. I understand. Because, I mean, I mean when, it, when it boils down to it, I mean, if you love music, you want to make your living in music. You don't want to have to do something else for a living because no one will hire you. Correct. I mean, I've been in this business for 62 years, and I've made an excellent living, you know, and I've never gotten a bad review. So evidently what I'm doing, what I'm still doing, and I had, I had 40 students this week in three days, and I, you know, I turned down probably five or six a week. Evidently what I'm still doing is in demand, and my students, all my students have 100% placement. Every one of them has a good job. So when I judge a competition, I judge that, too, because that's very important. Right. No, no, no. I, I, I understand. I understand. Um, and, 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 you know, you were also saying to me that uh, you don't comment on, on other people's playing uh, if you're not their teacher. Now, I think that that is a that is a fascinating practice and, and makes perfect sense, actually, uh, from a matter of, of a diplomatic standpoint, but also just on practical terms. You know, you're, you're not. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm not. I never comment on anyone publicly. Ah, okay, okay. Of course, you have your own opinion, but yeah, you don't. Yeah, okay, okay. I was in an opera house one time, and I'm leaving all the names and places out, obviously. And this person took me and said, Meister, wasn't that soprano horrible? Well, between us, she really was. But I said, I have no idea. Have a nice day. Now, if I just said that person was horrible, that person would have gone to her and, and told her, and, I, and I'd have had an enemy. Right. It was none of my business. I, I was I was taken to a major music school, you know, as a VIP. It was a major, one of the most prestigious music schools in the world. And I heard some of the lessons, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, my goodness, this is ghastly. But, of course, I didn't say that to my host. I mean, I walked in the auditorium. This one gal played Mendelssohn. It took me six measures into to realize what it was. <laughs> it was really that bad. <laughs> so I said to myself, well, I just said, well, Afterwards, I said, thank you very much for having me as a guest, and I wish you well. I'm always professional and a gentleman. You know, I don't have any enemies in the field as far as I know. I, I try to get along with everybody, and I mind my own business. I don't get involved in the politics and all the others. You keep your mouth clean. Right. If, if, if you go on my Facebook site, you will see that is a professional site. I make no comments on anything. If somebody sends me their, um, if somebody sends me their piece, I will say thank you for sharing. Thank you. They ask me for my opinion. I say, well, you have to ask your teacher. Now, if they decide that they want to quit the teacher they're at on their own and come study with me, then that's a different story. Mm. In, a, in a competition, you understand, you have a letter from the teacher giving you permission to judge the student. And at that point, I do, with permission. But I would never, ever comment on someone else's. Well, I was, I was in the store one time buying a piano for one of my students. And this mother was buying a Steinway Grand for this girl. It was about a $60,000 piano back then. And she was playing the little G major march from the uh, 
scenes from childhood, you know, the, the Shuma album for the young. Everything was wrong with her. She was playing F naturals, wrong rhythm, wrong notes. And my students started to laugh and I said, no, I should be quiet. So afterwards, the mother said, well, what did you think? So all I did was go to the next piano and play the piece we once. She says, oh, that doesn't sound like my daughter. I said, no, it doesn't. And, you th and she said, well, you think my daughter, you know, she said, think my daughter could use a change of teachers? I said, well, that'd be something to consider. So she changed teachers, but I didn't once ever say anything. I let her draw her own conclusions and I just agree with her. That, 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 is, that is the mark of a great teacher. Because I don't, you know, I don't criticize someone you else's can, students. You can, you can lead a horse to water, you can't force it to drink. And that's right. I mean, do my students, do I tear things apart? Yeah, we can spend two hours on one movement with Beethoven Sonata, very easy. Mm. I go, I'll go note by note if I have to. Right. But, but if, if it's, if it's, it's none of my business. You know, I'll be playing in a city and they'll say, what do you think of that recital last night? I said, well, I don't know. I didn't hear it, so I can't comment. I have no idea. <laughs> what do you think of that pianist? Well, they're, 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 very, they're very well known. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I would, I, I would I, dance. I, well, you know, that's I think that's where that's that's something where you and I would differ because I I, I pull no punches. You know, I, I I I say I say exactly what I think. And, and if they don't like it, then that's too bad. So, uh, you know, I do have enemies, uh, but 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 I think I think in a life well lived, if you have no enemies, you haven't really lived. Well, you know, remember, discretion is the better part of valor. That's right. You said that, and that was a beautiful. That was actually that was so beautiful that 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 you know it made me want to remedy my ways. But, <laughs> but. well, I mean, okay, I mean, the profession, the profession is large enough for everybody. It is. You know? It is. Yeah. No, you're right. There is there is space for everybody. You know, and 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 people there. You know. You know. Well, and this is the other thing. I, I'm just as happy jamming with a three-year-old child as I am with a 50-year-old, you know, uh, maestro who is, who's been doing this for 40 years. That fine, you know, to, to me, it's equally interesting. And I know that's a controversial opinion because what, you know, the, 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 the difference between, you know, a three-year-old, you know, making noise on a piano to, you know, a seasoned, you know, professional who has dedicated their life to music. Yeah, the, the difference is stark. But for wow. me, it's equal, it's equally interesting because, uh, you know, like you said, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And for me, music is, is an expression of curiosity. So, you know, so I, I tend to be interested by the people that are that are the most curious about about music and, and that are that are, you know, that are alive, that are that are asking questions that are doing, you know, uh, interesting things. So, you know, if somebody gives me a, a perfect clinical rendition of a, of a Bach fugue um, and, you know, and some, you know, 10 year old, you know, plays half the notes wrong, but 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 has so much passion that it, it moves me, then I'd rather listen to that 10 year old than, than the person that did the clinical rendition. And some people might not agree with that, but that's just my opinion. Well, no, I understand. Well, you know, music is, what I do is a very lofty thing. And it's a very, it's a sacred tradition. And I frankly refuse to get involved in all this pettiness. Right. I refuse to put myself on that level. Mm. I just, you know, he said, she said, I will not do that. You know, I'm I'm a very private person. You know, I if I can sit all, if I can sit the pen all day and practice, that's all I need. I don't need anybody in my life unless I choose to have them in my life. You know, people. I mean, I don't. You know, I don't. I I don't. When I teach for four days. The days I'm practicing, I don't answer the phone. I don't answer the door. I'm I move to Mars. I'm not there. You know? mm -hmm. So I don't. I'm not getting involved with this nitpicking and this backbiting. Right. Right. I, I refuse to put myself on that level. Yes. You know, when, when you meet somebody and you talk to that person, you're, you're, you're teaching that person how to, how, to, how to treat you. And I treat people with courtesy and respect, everyone with courtesy and respect. Mm. I don't care if it's the waitress at the restaurant. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are treated with courtesy and respect, and, and, you know, and I expect to be treated the same way. Mm. Mm. You know, you but treat your people... You want the others. You want you treat you treat people like you want to be treated. Yes, the golden rule. Well, you know, yes. but I'm sure I'm sure that you know. In I mean, you've been doing this for a, you know, a long time. I'm sure you've yes. encountered your fair share of you know. Pardon my French assholes. And I'm sure you've enc encountered them. Uh, you know, but then I suppose the way you, the way you choose to deal with that is really what differentiates you from them. Well, yes, and I mean, you know, 
I've been in rehearsals and I've had, I had a problem one time with a young pianist and, but I handle it in a professional way. Right. You know, I mean, it, it, yes, I mean, it, I will disagree with people and I've sat on numerous symphony boards and committees and, you know, for years, but it's how, it's how you basically handle it. Yes. My mother used to have a saying when we were kids, it's one jackass in the room, let's not have two. And I think this was, and I think this was very good advice. So, you know, you think of what you say before you say it, because once you take the words out, they, you, they can never come back. Right. No, you can't. I had, a, them. Well, I had a person one time that was very obnoxious to me. And when I said, when I said to this person, I said, well, I said, first of all, we have, we have two different types of people. We have people that have something to say, and we have people that think they have to say something. I'll let you figure out which one that is. Secondly, we have high class, low class, and no class. And I'll let you decide which one you're on that too. And I bid them good day and walked away from them. Give him something to think about. I like that. I like that very much. That that that's so that's that that's how I handle that situation. You 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 won that duel with with the utmost elegance. Precisely. I mean, I'm a 19th century person, and I can my manners are according. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. I, I am I am the I am the conservatory of 1850. You know, basically. <laughs> No, seriously, I have, I, have, I have dress rules for my students. We have language rules. We have behavior rules that are all enforced in my studio. Right. And, and, and so, I mean, I presume then they, 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 they can't just walk into your studio wearing, I don't know, shorts and a T-shirt. No, absolutely not. My, my apprentices have to be in suits at all times. People, I dress nice for them. They dress nice for me. They respect my house. We don't allow any use of language. Uh, there are no yups, nopes, and yas. Every one of those cost them a dollar. And a, a swear would cost them five dollars. They have to put it in the money bowl. <laughs> oh boy! Wow. So I I, I treat I I train my students to be professionals, to be ladies and gentlemen, and to conduct themselves in a manner of fitting of the art they are representing. Yes. Well, my father yeah. my father would absolutely love you. Like my, my father would, would absolutely love you. You know, he's, he's always going on to me. He says, you know, Afraz, you have to, you know, you have to always, you know, you know, be kind and courteous and have etiquette. And, you know, you know, he's always, he's always telling me, you know, Afraz, you need to, you know, you, you need to work on that. You know, you should not be swearing. You shouldn't be doing this and you shouldn't be doing that. And I, I always look at him and say, oh, dad, you're too conservative. But, but I think you're right. You know, I mean, there, there is an elegance to that. There is an elegance to that, a distinction that, that, you know, that, that, Without saying anything, just by your manner, you can, that you can convey, um, you know. Um, and I, I, had a, I had a teacher one time that taught me: if you walk into a room of two thousand people, you better be the one to notice. Yes. One of my professors years ago taught me that rule. So I, you know, I always handle things like I, you know, I treat our people like I wanted to be treated. And and having a very high IQ, I'm really one. Of the, I'm really one of the five hundred smartest people in the world. So I can be, I can be very, um, well, I can say something very elegantly and I can be very cutting, but I can do it very, uh, politely. Yes. Very, polite, you know, and I mean, I mean, I have put people in their place with two sentences without being mean or nasty. Right. Yes. Well, I, I, I certainly, I, I certainly value that very much. I mean, I, I, I like, I like to think that I'm, I'm incisive like that myself, but see the problem for me, the problem for me is. You know, when, when, when I find somebody has lost my, you know, I respect everybody equally. I treat everybody equally. I, I, you know, I'm respectful. I'm kind. I'm polite. But, but if, if somebody, you know, is disrespectful or they, I guess you could say they, 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 they do something that, that, you know, that, that makes them less worthy of the respect that, that I've given them out of courtesy, then, then. You know, and sometimes the, then you know there are no there there are no holds barred. I mean, for example, okay, and, and and I'm gonna this is a very simple example. You know, the idea of calling somebody maestro, okay, um, you know, uh, the same person that said, "Oh, you'll never amount to anything," insisted upon being called maestro, and he was he was the, I think the principal violist of of some orchestra. So he, so anyway, so he 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 said, you know. You, you don't call me by my first name. You must always call me Maestro. And uh, you see, Maestro is an honorific title. It's a title of respect. And yes. As, and, and, and as such, you cannot insist that somebody calls you that. 
It's 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 you know the the it, that it, it, you call somebody that because you have the utmost respect for them as a player, as a composer, as a teacher, whatever, as an impresario yeah. for whatever reason. So you cannot yeah. insist on being called maestro. And the fact that he insisted on on being called maestro, I thought actually quite ironically made him unworthy of that of of that distinction whether whether or not he thought he was worthy is, is in, it, whether he was worthy or not we will not discuss but the fact that he insisted on it i thought made him unworthy well actually you know my story is not something you can just call yourself really nilly you actually have to be elected to that by someone else correct my total maestro and i won't and i won't mention names again but i actually had paperwork the two of the most famous musicians in the world that informed me that the, the, the board had decided this. I actually have the I actually have the paperwork to prove it. Mm, 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 mm. So I mean, if, if anybody can call themselves. You know, maestro means exalted teacher. If you if you, if you really translate it out. Okay? Yes. And that's something you know. That's something you have to earn. I mean, you know the, the, that that is you know that that is earned, not bestowed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, in, I do. I mean. I I totally understand. It's it's the same thing in in you know in the classical Indian tradition to be called ustad or sa or saheb or g or any of these things. These are the you have to earn it, you know. Um, and and only only when somebody calls you when only yeah you would never you would never refer to yourself as ustad. You know, other people would refer to you as ustad. It's the same thing with with maestro. You know, I mean, yes, you know, when you've earned it, you can use it formally as as you do and and as I do. But but perhaps there's uh, there, there's this idea that you know, oh, you you can you can grant yourself the title, but no, it doesn't work like that, you know. Um, and yeah. and and I think the fact that that this person wanted wanted to enforce uh, to me that that they should be called maestro was, well, I mean, it seriously seriously devalued their 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 you know their claim, uh, you know, in my opinion. I I thought I thought that that was classless. Well, I and ran baseless. to a person. I ran to a person one time when I was on tour, and this person told me flat out they were the greatest pianist in the world. Right. And well, I said, you know, if you're gonna if you make a if you're gonna make a claim like that, okay. And and look, I, 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 I have nothing against people that want to make claims like that, but you better be able to back it up. If you can't back it up, then you know, shut up and sit down. Like like. No. Well, what happened is we, we were near a piano. I said, okay, would you please play for me? At that point, he, what he played for me was the Waldstein Sonata, a Beethoven. He played the first movement. Okay. Well, let me put it this way: it was less than stellar. So I said, when he finished, I sat down and I played the first movement, and I walked away, and his jaw was on the cement. So I didn't. I didn't say. I didn't say one word. I let my playing do the do the talking. Yeah. <laughs> his eyeballs were out of his head. <laughs> And I just said, have a good day. And he was, I mean, I'm sure he never said that comment again. Right. Right. I, exactly. I, I didn't make any comment. I just, I just simply sound played the piece. Yeah. You know, I, I, I let, I, I let my playing do my talking for me. That, that's very wise. No, the, the, you see the work, the, the, the work and the, the talking and the actions, the, those speak much louder than words because any, yeah. any, any jackass can say, oh, I'm the world's greatest pianist. I mean, you know, don't don't say that. Let other people say that about you. And let you know if if you really are the world's greatest pianist, you don't have to say it. People well, you know, will, people will know. Well, you know, the, the Book of Proverbs says, "Let other people praise thee, and not thy own tongue." You know. Right, right, and 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 you know, and and look, I I I've I've been formally studying the ego and the idea of the self for a very long time, and and so I. I know that just even in terms of purely biological and evolutionary terms, we do need an ego because it's our sense of self. It's our self of uh, sense of uh, 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 perseverance and pres preservation. You know, uh, if you didn't right. have an ego, you wouldn't you wouldn't value yourself or your life enough to. Well, what, what you have to understand is the musical talent we have is a gift from God. Bach had it right. Every composition he wrote was Deo, Sol, the Sol in Gloria. And God be the glory. It's a gift. You didn't earn it. So you can't boast them. I tell people when wait, I train a student. Wait. So you, you, you're, you're saying that, that, that the, the gifts that you have received, they're, they're, you've not earned them. That's not part of your karma. It's just, it's just, it's just okay. bestowed. My talent, my talent was from God. Okay. Okay. The, what I did with it. Okay. What, you know, what, what, when the Lord gave me the talent, that was his gift to me. What I did with that talent is, the, is his gift back to him. It's like the Bible with the story of the three talents. 
When I have a talented student and they and they and they tell you how wonderful that student is, I said, Well, I didn't give them their gift. All I did was develop the gifts to the best of their ability. I don't take credit for the gift because I can't. It's not mine to take credit for. You understand? I just I, I said all I can take credit is what I did with it. Right. To help them grow. But I can't. This is a gift. You can't take credit for a gift because it was a gift. And Bach had it right. He understood everything he did was for God's glory. And he understood where that came from in the first place. He had it absolutely right. You know, Bach was probably one of the only class composers that never wrote any junk. He didn't write cheap dance tunes for commissions. He didn't write everything he wrote was quality. There was no junk in Bach. You know? So that's what you have to remember. I mean, I, I remember I always, I'm very aware of where my gift came from and the responsibility that goes with that. You know, the Bible says so much be given, so much be expected. So I understand that when I stand before the Lord on Judgment Day, I'm going to have to answer for that gift. So, if, you know, he's given me a large gift, so I have to work hard to, to maintain that gift. I'm, I'm aware of that every day I sit down at the piano. Mm. That's how I look at that, mm. you see. Mm. 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 I'm, I'm a Christian, and that's, that's how I look at it. It's, it's a gift, and he's entrusted me with this. So, you know, when he takes me home, I have to answer for everything I did. And for what I did with that gift and how I, you know, and how I use that gift for his glory. And that's, that's the way it is. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I come, I was raised in a, in a Muslim family, um, you know, so I come from a Muslim background, an esoteric sect of Islam, um, you know, based on Sufism, uh, you know, uh, which is based on the idea of inner searching and, and, you know, and making your own meanings, you know, um, it's, 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 you know, it is said that you know each person that interprets the Quran uh, is is given the the privilege and the honor of of being having the right to do so. So you know so if if you're trying to interpret it and you're trying to do that faithfully, then even if you make a mistake in in your interpretation, God will forgive it. That's that's what the that's what is claimed. You know. You know, and so as 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 I'm sure you understand, and I'm sure you well understand that you know. Uh, depending on your level of of understanding and and awakening and 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 as you said your gift you know people will have different understandings of of you know of whatever it happens to be even 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 a, a phrase that is that is recited by every muslim you know you might have a, a a billion different ideas of what it means and that's perfectly acceptable well we all have to interpret you know that to our own you know and fascinating and, and Exactly. I mean, I know, you know, I know what I'm supposed to do every day and I just, and I do it. I work faithfully towards it. Right. But, so for, that's... For, but for, for me, you know, just the idea of blind faith has never made any sense, you know? So, so I, you know, um, I, I have, I have formally explored atheism, agnosticism. I've studied all of the world's religions, uh, you mm -hmm. know, and so, so, you know, when, when people ask me, you know, are you a Muslim? Are you what you know? What's your what's your spirituality? My my, my response is always that you know that's a, that's a private matter that I don't wish to discuss, and uh, you know, uh, and and that that it doesn't it doesn't really matter because that's for me. Right. Well, my faith is not blind, in other words. Yes. Right. And, but, and that's and that's and that's what I'm saying. As I as I tell people when they interview me, I said there's two things I don't discuss. One is religion, and two is politics. <laughs> right. Yes, and, and, and my father tells me the same thing. He says, you know, don't discuss religion and don't discuss politics. That'll, that'll, that'll save you a lot of headache and a lot of... Well, you know, I, I, think, I think there's a terrible mistake, for example, and this, is, this has happened a couple of times to some major artists. They've lost their careers. They play the piano very well, and then they start expressing their political views in the government. I know one colleague of mine, he, he, he's, a, he's from a you know, European country. He, he actually criticized that country. And they told him if he, if he ever came back again, they'd cut his hands off. So, I mean, you know, he's, I told him, I said, you play the, play the piano. No one cares what you think personally. It's no, not even nobody's business but your own. Hmm. I mean, there was another pianist who criticized something and they canceled, they canceled this person's concerts all over the world. They lost two or three, two or three of my colleagues this has happened to. They are, they, are, they are paying to hear you play. We had a person that came to America and they criticized it and they're forbidden to come back in the country ever. You know, you're being paid there. They are, you are providing a service, you know, like the dentist, the butcher, the baker, whatever. You are being played, the, you are being paid to play the piano. That's what you're doing. Your other opinions do not matter, and those are between you. You know, you're not to be sharing those publicly because they can end your career. 
Because first of all, these people weren't qualified to comment on that anyhow. They're not politicians, they're pianists. Couldn't you be both? You know what I'm saying? Well, well, yeah, possibly. But these two, I mean, it, it, it'd, be like, it'd be like my my dentist discussing the fine points of Bach with me and never played the piano. Well, that's that's okay. He has his opinion. And I listen to him, especially when he's drilling my teeth. I listen carefully. <laughs> Yeah, you don't you don't want to offend you don't want to offend the dentist as he's drilling into your teeth. That 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 might be that might have that, devastating consequences. You know that that's that's a that's a very bad you know that's a very bad idea. You know, there's an old African proverb that translates loosely: "Never insult the alligator to cross the river." <laughs> and I think I think that's very good advice. Yes. I mean, I I will discuss music, you know, with someone. Who knows music? I mean, I listen to opinions, and I will be polite, you know. Yeah. And, and sometimes, some if, if if they get a date wrong or a composition wrong, I will correct them mm. and say, "You have the wrong, you know, you have the wrong date. That's the wrong composer. And this is this is the this is the piece. It's really not that. It's this." You know? Yes. There, there's a little book. There's a little book of preludes and fugues that are always included in the complete works of Bach. You know, the eight little preludes and fugues. They weren't written by Bach. They were written by Ludwig Krebs, his student. So that, you know, so if someone says that's Bach, I said, no, that's Krebs. <laughs> they put Bach's name on to sell it, but it's not Johann Sebastian Bach, it's Ludwig Krebs. So I will correct somebody if they do that, but that's as far as my comments go, you understand? Yes, yes, no, I, I understand. Now, you know, I, I think there, I mean, there, there is a cognoscenti, you know, um, who know who know about music, but are maybe not necessarily musicians themselves in practice. You know, you, they, they oh, might yes. they might be impresarios, they might be connoisseurs of, of music oh, yes. or the oh, yes. arts, oh, yes. and 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 they 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 will know they they will really know what they're talking about. You know, and oh yes, and, and will be authorities on the on the on the matter. Oh yes, I I totally agree, and I have met some of those people. And it was it was very enlightening to talk with them. But as one of my teachers said years ago, very succinctly to a student, some people talk out of one orifice and some talk out of the other. You can decide which one you're using. <laughs> uh, well, I thought that was a very nice way of putting it. Yes, yes, and 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 well, it was polite, but also also like you know, very very descriptive, very graphic. Well, you know, you, you know, for example, you know, Johannes Brahms had a really offbeat sense of humor. You know, one time he went to a string quartet concert and the viewers came up and said, well, what did you think of my temples? He said, oh, I, I loved you. I said, I love the temples and I especially enjoyed yours. And then one time two ladies were doing a performance of Haydn's creation. He says, ladies, why are you dragging that slow? You must have played it much faster under Haydn. So the, the closers had, you know, he would say it very elegantly. He was in a restaurant one time and he left and said, if there's someone I forgot to insult tonight, I sincerely, I sincerely apologize. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, they were very elegant in, in their comments, you know. Yes. Well, what do you think of Victor Borga? Well, Victor Borga, you know, Victor Borga actually was a very good pianist. Yeah. Well, so was Liberace, too, if you boil down. They were both excellent pianists. They really were. Yeah. And what about... But, but what about Oh, go ahead. But I mean, I mean, they found a way to make a lot of money doing what they did. I mean, Borger was an excellent pianist. And he, he he was world famous, and so was Liberace. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they were both they were both fine pianists, but they found a way. There, there's a comedian. I don't. She she's known in America. I don't know if you know her name. Her name is Phyllis Diller. She was a this ugly housewife that was did all these crazy movies, you know. And she she made a million millions of dollars doing this, you know. But she was really a very fine pianist. Mm. And when she, when she retired from the movie, she had her face lifted. And I heard her play with the Detroit Symphony. And you could not have played the concerto any better. She said, well, I had to be the ugly housewife to make a living. Now I can do what I want to do. You know, but the the, the uh, pianist Dudley Moore, the actor, was also an excellent pianist. I mean, there's a lot of people that, that played very well. They just did something else for a living. Right. You know, I mean, Borga, Borga was really funny, and so was you know, Liberace. You know, they, they, Liberace was the highest paid entertainer in the world. He outsold everybody. He, you know, every, he, no one was paid more than he was for a program. Yes, well, well, I mean, he definitely showed off his wealth. I mean, at one time he, he wore a, 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 fur, a fur coat that, that had a train that I think was six feet or seven feet long. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 
So if, but, that, you know, if that is an opulence, I, I don't really know what is. But if you go back and listen to his beginning, you know, his recordings when he first started out, he plays very well. It's always Victor Borga back then. I mean, they both were excellent games. So what they found? Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go on. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on on Virgil uh, Fox? Well, he was number one too. He was he was a fine organist, and I I met him on a couple of occasions. Mm. But he found a way of, you know, making it. He, you know, he he got he caught the younger audience. He found a way of making the younger audience like Bach, for example. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, no, he, he, he he was quite a character. He was quite a character. Yeah. Um, and there's not. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, no, 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 certainly not. And look, if, if they're getting paid and, and, and they have an audience, then like you said, there's space for all of all, all of all, all of us, you know. Um, but That's right. you know, yeah, but it, it would be it would be nice to, you know, to earn a million dollars in one performance. Well, that would be nice, yes, of course it would. You know. Um, and uh, and there's people that have done it. Um, you know. I always teach my students, I always teach my students I say, do what you love and the money will come later. Right. I mean, you know, money won't buy happiness. So, I mean, doing your job and getting a little less at it and doing something else you hate and getting more money, there's, there's no choice as far as I'm concerned. Indeed, indeed. In fact, I, I made that very argument with my father. You know, my, when I said my, my father was saying to me, oh, you know, you, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be more, you know, you'd be in a better position to contribute to the knowledge societies and the artistic societies of the world, you know, if, if you were very rich and had a lot of money. I, and I said, look, so so what? You want me to be an investment banker and be unhappy? You know, I'd, I'd rather I'd rather I'd rather make a modest living and, and do what I love and be happy than than than. You well, know. my father did not did not want me to go into music. He couldn't think. He he said, you'll never make a living of it. Well, when I was sixteen years of age, I made more money a week than he did, and that ended that argument permanently. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how that one came out. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, are you familiar with the Wanamaker organ and uh, and the Longwood Garden organ? Yes, the Wanamaker organ I've seen. That was in what used to that's in what what currently is Macy's in Philadelphia. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yes. That's, yes. It's a, it's a very fine organ. It, it's it's really nice. I, I am familiar. With it. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. It's 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 very interesting. You know. And I mean, to have a sample library of that instrument would be really, really, really great. Oh yes, absolutely. Well, you know, when when I, when I go on tour, if I have a day or so, I can run around and look at the organs, and you know, if I, I'm in the city and have a little bit of extra time, and you know, I'll be invited to come in and try this or try that, or, you know. So I, I before 9/11, I was actually traveling 100,000 miles a year. I was gone every weekend. Wow. So I, I got I got to see a lot, and you know, and I got to try a lot of different things, you know, when I was in the different cities, you know, which was very nice. And and I presume that when you travel, you know, you 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 take your apprentices with you. You have a team. Yeah, I uh, yes, I take apprentices with me, and of course they, they send me obviously first class, you know, first class hotels, limousine, and everything. So, but with the apprentice, when I tour, I, I eat, I sleep, and I play. They take care of the contract negotiation, checking the hall. They take care of that's their job, and this is training them also. So so when I go, I take one, sometimes two, if if they you know if the parties agree to the, the finances. Yes, and that's that's part of my apprentice program. My apprentices, my current apprentices, even of course, well, I'm not touring right now because everything's locked down. Obviously, there's no borders. Open. But the, the, you know, the, the, the apprentices are at church every Sunday with me. They help me with the church work. They watch me practice. They watch how I, they watch how I do things. They come over on Thursday nights. They watch me practice. They have 24-hour access to me. They can drop me anytime I'm working. You know, anytime I'm practicing, they're always welcome. Some two of them have keys to the house. They just they just come when they want. That's how I that's how my apprentice program is. Right, 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 right. Yeah, well that that makes a lot of sense because they're they're getting to see you in process, and I think that's the most valuable education. Exactly, exactly. Have you played a pedal piano before? Yes, yes, I did. In fact, you know, Schumann wrote his um, Opus 56, you know, that the pieces on this, it's, it's, it was uh, re, uh, rewritten by Debussy for two pianos, actually written for pedal pianos. I played a pedal piano, I played a pedal harpsichord. Yes. The harpsichord that E. Power Biggs recorded, you know, that one on that album, was written by a gen was built by that gentleman who was John Chalice, who was from Detroit, who was a friend of mine. And I was there when that actually was being built. 
Mm. And I was there actually when E-Power Biggs came. In fact, I was practicing in church one time on this tracker. And I finished some Bach and he, I heard a voice behind me. That was very well played. And I turned around to thank who it was and it was E-Power Biggs. He had come in to try the harpsichord. So I was 16 years of age, but I had, I had something to tell in school the next day in music class. <laughs> yeah, well, that that's incredible. That's really amazing. So I turned around and there he was, because he, he, John Charles had brought him in to see the organ. And then I got then I got to hear him play the harpsichord before the before the album was done. Well, you know, uh, the 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 person that I was referring to, who the 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 self styled, uh, you know, who enfor well, no, the guy who would, who wanted to enforce being called maestro and and you know, said you won't amount to anything. He also said, you know, you should not address, you should not address the masters uh, directly. You only speak when you're spoken to, you know, which, um, which, you know, you could, I guess is the protocol, you know, when you're dealing with somebody like royalty or something like that. But anyway, this, he, he basically he says, you know, you, you cannot address the, the, the master, you know, so in this case, you know, it was, it was Martha Argerich and, um, you know, and, and I, I, I had, you know, I think I, I asked her a question, um, you know, about something, or or I was showing her something, and uh, and and he was like, "How dare you talk to the the, the master?" You know what he what, what what he 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 missed the point because actually, uh, uh, you know, Martha had seen the the poster of me, you know, outside w advertising the concert that I was doing, uh, with me on on you know a picture of me at a pipe organ, um, and so she was asking me, "Do you play the piano?" And I said, "Yes, yeah, well, I do play. I do play the piano." And uh, you know, we were talking, and, and he was like, "How dare you address the the, the 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 master?" But you know, and so she had to intervene and step in and said, "No, actually, you know, I I actually I'm the one that that you know started the conversation." But it, but it was just it was like. Well, it, it's the old adage: children should be seen and not heard. <laughs> yeah, and it's that's just such nonsense. I mean, it's like you know, I mean. You know, if if and if you're going to learn anything, you're you're good. You have to interact. I mean, the way you learn is through the interaction. You know, if you're just going to sit there silently and observe, you know, there's only so much you can learn. It's in the interaction. It's in the dialogue that that you know you really learn. You know, like you said, when, the students observe you in process. Well, well, yes. When when I go on tour and I and I'm in the green room after the concert, I agree to people coming through. Mm. But if there's young pianists that have questions, you know, I just say, okay. There's a, there's a, there was a long bench. I said, just go have a seat over there. And when I'm done, I'm going out to dinner and I will take you with me and you can ask all the questions you want. <laughs> and that's how I did it. So I, I took him to the, I took him to a first class restaurant for dinner. That's very nice of you. That's very nice. And I said, I said, and you can ask all your questions. But, you know, when you're greeting people to a reception line, I mean, you can't have people staying there for an hour. You better keep it moving. <laughs> Because they're people's times, you know, someone waiting to talk to you, you can't. So if someone has a long conversation, I say, well, just, why don't you just go over there? And when I'm done, we'll talk. Right. If people just want to say, I liked your performance. And I mean, then they got to go. You can't, you got 500 people staying on that line. You can't sit there and be, no. you know, they'd be there forever. You'd be there forever. Yes. So I, you know, so I always, I always tell my students, you know, there's no such thing as a stupid question. If you don't understand, I have a little seven-year-old right now I'm teaching. They just turned eight. This kid's got perfect pitch, perfect sense of rhythm. He's off the charts. So he comes in, you know, he, he figured out the whole first genopathy of Eric Satie by ear and came in and played it for me. You know, so, so he's always asking questions, you know, and, and he'll he'll call me and he'll ask me a question, you know. You know, and I just, you know, and he'll write, he'll write me, he'll send me something on Messenger, you know, on Facebook, and I'll let him know back and stuff. No, but I mean, the, the, the times I will not be bothered is before I play. You know, when you when you play anybody, you might, that I refuse to see anybody before I go on stage. I don't care who it is. That's a that's a cardinal rule with me. Afterwards, I'm more than happy to talk to people. But my mind is on getting ready for that concert, and I don't want to be disrupted. And I will not. My managers have, you know, direct. My manager is a martial arts guy. He's like Rambo. I mean, you wouldn't dare argue with him. So, you know, but, but no, that's that's the time I will not see people. But I am a time I'm available. People stop me on the street all the time, when I, especially when I did. I had my own radio show for years called The Piano Hour. People would recognize my voice. I did some major TV work on the major stations here. And people would say, oh, I just loved your playing. And I, you know, I would stop, they stopped in the supermarket or in the cleaners. And I would just thank you so much. I was always, you know, be, be polite and, and nice. I hope, I hope you can watch the next show. I hope you enjoy the next program and that kind of thing. 
one time I was in a sitting down having lunch and I look oh, there's a guy, young guy sitting in the booth across from me. <laughs> I said, Well, what can I do for you? He said, Maestro, I have some questions. I said, All right, I'll buy you lunch. Let's let's talk, you know. So I don't, you know, I don't hold people at arm's length. No, I don't. You know, I asked my teacher so many when I went to college and I went to have lunch, did I sit with the students? Of course not. I sat with the professors because that's where I was going to learn something. Yeah. And I'd ask them about, you know, I'd ask them, well, besides when I went to school, I had no money. I was very poor and I, I knew that they would buy me dinner. So that was another reason I sat there. But, but you know, I, I say, what about that lecture this morning? What about this? What about, and they, they never told me that I was bothering. They were glad that, you know, I, would, yes. I took the time to take, to take the interest. Yes, and, and, and you know, and that's that's fascinating because, you know, I never, um, when I was younger, I never had friends my age. You know, I always was friends with the old, with people that were much older. Um, and, and you know, um, you know, and, and, and one, yes. one teacher, one, one teacher of mine said to my mother, you know, uh, your son does not spend any time with his peers. And, and my, 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 my quip, my witty remark, because I was in the room was, yes, actually, I do. Exactly. Well, you know, when, when I when I was in school, I was off in the corner reading a book. I didn't really pay much attention to what was going on around me. Same, same, exactly. You know, in, in, in grade, I think it was grade two or grade three, you know, um, the, the teacher was was talking about who knows, who knows what she was droning on about. You know, I was reading a book uh, under the table, you know, and, 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 and she, she knew I was not paying attention. So she tried to call me out, you know, tried to make me look like a fool in front of everyone. She asked me a very difficult question. Um, and I, without, without even looking up, I answered the question and just kept reading. Well, that would stop it right there, wouldn't it? You know, and she was very upset about that. She was furious. She, she sent me to the principal and, 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 you know, and I ended up having a, you know, a conversation with the principal for an hour and then coming back, you know, and, and never coming back to the class. And then, so she said, she calls the principal and says, what happened? And he says, oh, we had a fascinating conversation. So she got even more upset and she, and she called my parents and says, your son doesn't pay attention in class. He's always reading a book. He always got his nose in a book. You know, I don't want him in my class. Anyway, so, so, you know, you, you deal with this kind of, this kind of stuff. No, I, 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 I certainly understand. I certainly understand. Yeah. But that, but that's okay. That's I think I think that's life. You 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 learn you learn you learn to you learn to sort of adapt and and to 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 be who you want to be anyway. And uh, you know, regardless of what other people think. Well, I don't. And I never pay. You know, and, and what the way I look at, and God we trust, all of us pay cash. You know? So I just simply, you know, I just simply, um, you know, I don't. Okay, if my teachers told me something, when I picked my teachers, I figured they didn't get what they got by not knowing what they were doing. If they told me to do something, I did it without question. Right. Especially, my last teacher, Misha Cather, could play the entire piano repertoire by memory. You understand what I'm saying? You could not find a piece he did not know. When he studied with Von Zauer, he told me he practiced 18 hours a day in Vienna. When that's he was studying with him. Yeah, that, that's, that's absolutely insane. That's that's. Uh, I, well, I, I could go to the library and find an old parlor piece that had a lot of dust on it. I would blow the dust off the piece. I would learn the first 16, 17 measures. I would bring it in, set it to the piano. I'd stop the middle of the measure. He'd pick it up on the note that I finished and smile at me. He never opened the book for a lesson. If you were playing a concerto, he would do the reduction. And it was much better than Kalmus or International. His wife studied under Godofsky at the Berlin Hochschule. Oh. She was a mother's fan. But no matter... You, you, you could you could name any piece. He, would, he, he was he was touring the Ukraine at eight years of age. He was Leopold's always a Kupmus, who was the greatest violinist at that time when he was fifteen. He actually played for Rachmaninoff. So he, he you know you couldn't find a piece he didn't know. Right. I, now when I when I studied with him, I practiced nine hours a day. The assignments he gave you, he didn't fool around. One bad lesson, you were gone. I mean, there was no no if and he was definitely old school. Mm, mm, mm. But I've learned so much from them. And, and so is it is it like that with you and your students that that they have to take this very very seriously? They have to give their life for it. Oh, absolutely. What, what I ask, we have a phone audition. I say on a scale of one to ten, one's not important at all. Ten is the most important thing in your life. What do you rate this? If it's not at least an eight, I I just say okay, let me make a referral. I send them to somebody else. Let's have a conversation. That's as far as they give. It. Yes. I have I have one lady. She's a retired educator. She took piano lessons for forty years, doing absolutely nothing. 
she came to me. She practices four to six hours a day. And she's, you know, she's already through uh, orchestration. She loves what she's doing. Yes, if you come to me, this has got to be a fantastic priority. I don't take you. Because if you're taking, if you're taking time away from my practice time, you better be worth it. That's the way I look at it. If I'm giving up an hour of my practice time to teach you, you better be worth my time. Because you know? yes. I'd rather practice that, but you know, I know. I, if a student has an unprepared lesson, they pay by the month. They will call me and say, Maestro, I'm really sorry. I was sick this week. My aunt died. I had to go to the funeral. I couldn't practice this week. I'll see you next week. And they pay for the lesson. They don't even bother to show up because they know I'm going to send them home in two minutes. So, the, uh, yes, I run my studio very strict. I have a we have cancellation policies. We have all kinds of rules and regulations. Yes, we do. Yes, yes. And and so is this all? I mean, I presume then it's all it's all a contract, or is it or is it just an understanding, you know, between you and the students? Yes, yes, yes understanding. I mean, I've had st I've had students on my I want students on my schedule for forty one years. I've had two that have been on for twenty five years. And, you know, and th this is this is the way it is. I mean, you know, you you you, you come for lessons once a week until you tell me you're not coming anymore, basically. Mm -hmm. or, or, or until I decide that you're not doing your job and I get rid of you. But that's, that's kind of the understanding. I, I tell them at the beginning, this is the, these are the rules and regulations. If you can't live with these, tell me now and we will not begin. Yes. So they know when they get in and they get the cancellation policy in writing. Yes. If someone calls me, I said, well, read number seven. Well, let's read it out loud. Okay, so you just answered your question. Right. Now, my, my students are very good. That's one reason. That's one reason I still enjoy teaching after 62 years. I don't. I don't play any games with anybody. This is this is serious business with me. So that's that's how I handle with my students. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I, and I guess I'm going to say this to, to your audience too, to the young pianist. If you're fortunate enough to have an artist teacher, make sure you listen to that person play. I mean, this business of hands-on is a bunch of garbage. You know, you, you go to a shop and you put your hands on something, you won't have a hand left because you don't know what you're doing. Playing the notes is only 10%. You have to learn this by hearing it. Music is an oral art. So if you're fortunate enough, don't come in there with your, with, with, make your feeble attempt at playing the piano and never have you listen to your teacher play because you're not going to accomplish anything. 10% is a horrible grade. So I, if any of you have the privilege of studying with somebody like that, when I, when I was studying with my teacher, I went to every concert he gave. I would show up an hour before and an hour after, and I would just sit on a couch where they couldn't see me through the lessons. And that's how I learned a lot of this. It's very important. So on you know, Thursday nights is my apprentice night, where my apprentices can come. But there's, and then, of course, I, I'm at church every Sunday, and I do, I do major work still. They can come there. But, you know, in the lesson, you know, those, if, I'm, if, I, if I'm giving them a new piece, I will play section seven. I said, be careful of this. Watch this section. Now, I'm, an, I'm a... I'm an excellent reader. I can read almost anything at sight. I was a, I was staff accompanist as an undergrad at, at, at college. So wherever they bring me, I can say, okay, this, this or they bring me something to piano. You want to try this? I said, sure. And I, I can go through it. So, but you know, but just coming in and just you know, making your feeble attempt at playing the piano, playing the right notes, teacher putting a little star on the corner of the page and sending you, and another thing with, with teachers too, if you see a person coming out of the studio and they have one book of pieces, then you know they got a lousy teacher. Mm -hmm. They should have pieces, technical exercises, scales, theory, and clapping and counting. I do all five areas. Otherwise, you're not, all you're doing is, it's like teaching the parakeet to talk. All you're doing is teaching someone to play the piano by rote. They won't understand what they're doing. Right. And they will never progress. They will basically hit the brick wall. Yeah. So these are all things I explain to people. I said, when you come in, these are the areas we're going to be working. And we work in all five areas every single week. There's a book called Hindemith Elementary Training for Musicians. I don't know if you ever heard of that book or not. Are you yes. with it? Yes. You know, Nadia, you know, Nadia Boulanger used it with all her students. Mm. It's a very different, we, we actually did a freshman year in high school, but it's a very difficult book. I would imagine that probably most of the pianists, young pianists in the world would never, could not make it through the middle of that book, I would think. Mm. It's very difficult. I, when my students complete that book, they never have any problem counting anything ever again. I tell them, I say, if you can finish that book, I will certify to whoever it is that you know what you're doing. So that's how I basically teach. No, it's very serious. I mean, I, I, this is a sacred obligation. And I, I give the student my very best, and they give me their very best. 
They give me 100%, I give them 100%. That's how it works. Yes. I think that's the way it should be done. Well, that's what I've done for 62 years. And you know, you've received, you've received a lot of uh, distinctions and honors, you know, from, from many of the top institutions, including Cambridge. So, so that, that is, uh, well, I mean, that's, that's incredible that, you know, that, that you're so highly recognized um, by all these institutions. Well, I'm very honored that everybody likes what I do. I mean, I, my, my, my current resume is 800 pages. They're bound in books. I mean, all the who's who's books. It's just nice to be appreciated. It's nice to your colleagues. You know, these who's who's books, you can't, you can't buy your way in. You know, they, they send you a thing, they check your resume, you, you sign the thing, and you get in the book. You can't get in any other way. It's just nice. It's nice to be appreciated. That it was, it's nice to be, you know, someone, just, your colleagues, they say thank you for what you're doing. I just think it's very nice to, you know, to be, you know, people to do that. Indeed. Indeed. Well, people thank you. Work. Yes, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say, you know, th thank you. Thank you for your candor, uh, you know, and, and for giving us, you know, uh, this insight, this this window into into your life and into your practice, because um, I think a lot of young people who are pursuing music, you know, um, you know, they just they don't really know where to start. And and I think listening to, to you know, you talk about your, you know, your work and your life, I think will 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 be very helpful to them. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me on the program. I really enjoyed this. Well, my pleasure, and uh, and uh, definitely, I'll let you know once it's been uh, it's been published. Well, you you have my permission to put it both on uh, on Facebook and uh, LinkedIn. Wonderful, wonderful. Because I'm, I'm I'm sure that my students and you know some of the colleagues in general, I'm sure would enjoy this interview. Wonderful. Yeah. No. Um, absolutely. Yeah. I, I. I. mean, it's. It's great when. When. Uh, you know. When. When the interview reaches many people. You know. When. 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 Yeah. That's. That's one of the. One of the. the problems. When. When you. When. You, when you start. Uh, when you start something. You know. If at first it's difficult to disseminate. You know. You have to sort of earn. The. Uh, you know. The. The, the, you know, you, you earn you earn your viewership, you know, um, and, and in the Internet age, there's so much content that, you know, for people to listen to what you're producing, your content, you know, they have to they have to know that you exist, first of all. And second, you have to retain them with the quality of your content. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I understand. You know. Uh, I, I actually had one last question that, that, that just sure, came, sure, that, that, sure. That, came, that came to mind. Um, and, and this was about, um, you know, it's about, you know, you yourself are a conductor, right? And, and you, you, you have conducted yes. ensembles. So like when, when you're a soloist with, a, with an orchestra, right? Let's, let's say you're working, I don't know, with, with um, the LA, you know, the LA Philharmonic and you're working with, you know, their, their conductor and, and, you know, you're the soloist. And let's say you have, I don't know, uh, you have a different idea of what, what the music should sound like or where it should be going than the conductor. So it's like that time when Glenn Gould disagreed with Leonard Bernstein. Uh, on oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and he, put, he put the disclaimer on national that's television. Right. That's right. That's right. So has that, has that ever happened to you? And, and if so, then how, how, do you, how do you handle that without, making, without upsetting anyone? Well, okay. First of all, if, if I'm the conductor, I will meet with the soloist beforehand. We will, we will sit down at a piano someplace, okay? And I will go through the, I will go through the entire concerto with them. Now, you know, a, a, a conductor has to be a good accompanist, okay? Okay, so what happens, you know, and I let them, you know, it, okay, there's a ballpark of interpretation. It's maybe this wide. You can't go this wide. I mean, if you, if you distort rhythm so it's unrecognizable, you can't ask 100, and 10 people that mind read, you know, the thing is going to be a major train wreck. But there's be, there'll be a spot when they want to, um, you know, slow down or speed up. And, and if, it, if, it, if it's good, then I'll just mark it in my score. I'm a very good accompanist. You know, when I accompany singers, they always say, you know, you understand exactly what we want. Yes. I studied voice for years myself. Okay. Now, there was a, there was a time, one time when I was, when I was conducting and I did not, the soloist was sick, so I did not have a chance to meet with him. Okay. So, um, no, what was, no, 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 I'm sorry. I was the pianist. I didn't get a chance to meet with the conductor. And I walked in the room 
and it, you could cut the tension with a knife. I knew something had horrible had happened. I don't know what, I to, the orchestra was like, the books could kill, you know. So I walked in and said, good morning. And I, you could just, the air was just thick with hate. You could, you could just sense it. I thought, okay. I was playing the Beethoven first concerto, the C major. Okay. And this conductor started conducting and I stopped him about the sixth measure. I said, now we are doing the Beethoven concerto, <laughs> the first one. The piece, you know, the piece was in four, he's conducting it in three. So, you know, after several starts, I just said, okay, excuse me. So I took the concert master and I went to the union steward. And I asked the concert master, what happened in the first part? I said, we can't play into this guy. He's totally incompetent. So we, I went to the union steward. I said, okay, here's the options. I'm not going to play under him either. I can't. I said, find me another conductor. I can conduct on the piano or cancel the concert. Your choice. I'll buy by anything you, you say. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So what they did is they actually found another conductor who was in town. And I sat down with him in the hotel room and we did that without a rehearsal. He was marvelous. This guy was blacklisted. He never conducted again. He was blacklisted by the union. What, what I said privately to the, to the union steward, I said, I think this guy got his music degree over Cracker Jack box. That's, that's, what, that's what I said privately. I said, this is the most incompetent conductor I've ever seen in my life. He doesn't know three from four. He has no business even being in the profession. He should be in plumbing, mortuary science, or underwater basket weaving. I think I said something like that. To but that was privately between us. So obviously the guy did not come back. Yes. No, I mean, I, if, someone is, if someone's interpretation is valid, I'll let him do it. You know, but we but we need to work it out ahead of time, so we don't have a train wreck in the rehearsal. You know, rehearsals these days. You know, Toscanini could rehearse for days on end. He had you know he had the best orchestra in the world. These days, you only have so much time. Then you know, then the union starts screaming. You know, time and a half. You know, so you've got to get your work done efficiently and in the time allotted. Yeah. You you, you can't. You don't have forever. So by working this. Up, and you gotta have bathroom breaks. Of course. You know, you, you can't have a four-hour rehearsal and not, not ask people, people are going to ask to go, to go to the bathroom. So that's, the, that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a good accompanist. I mean, now some people I will not, I frankly will not work with. Because, I mean, it, it's so outlandish. I just don't want to put myself through it. So when, when the art, you know, they, they, had, they had discovered a, a, a piano concerto of Johann Strauss. He actually wrote it in Vienna. They discovered it. And I had an agent call me in, in Europe. He said, would you conduct this? I said, okay. And he, and he named who he wanted for the pianist. And I knew this pianist, Viennese style is a very specific style. You know, Strauss, it's like Strauss Walter. I said, this person wouldn't know, wouldn't know, frankly, Viennese style from a streetcar, but ran him over. And I said, I really don't have, I said, I really don't have time to give this guy piano lessons and spend the three months it would take to teach him to play it. So I'm going to decline the invitation. Thank you very much. And I just said, no. You know, I don't put my head in the alligator's mouth. <laughs> I, I know if something's, I, I know if something's not going to work and I'm not going to be happy because it's my reputation too. That's right. That's right. So a lot of times someone will call me, would you please play for me? And I say, I'm really sorry. I'm very booked right now. I'm not available. Can I recommend something to you? And someone else is heavy. There was one soprano one time. She couldn't get along with she couldn't get along with anybody. Every every accompanist walked out. And they, they finally called me and said, okay, well, you know, said, Maestro, you you you're a diplomat, you can get along with anybody. So I went in there. I said good morning. That's all I said to her. And she started on me something awful. I said, I said, wait a minute, let's stop right now. But here's the deal. No one else in the city wants to work with you. I'm going to work with you. I'm not going to be a, this is not a boxing match and I'm not going to do this with you. If you're going to be rude to me, I'm going to walk out. The concert is going to be canceled. You're going to be blacklisted and you're not going to ever sing in this city ever again. Now, what choice would you like? Is it, oh, is it door number one, door number two, or door number three? I said, we, we, will, we will conduct ourselves as professionals. We will keep our conversations to musical matters. Is that, is that perfectly clear? And she agreed to it and I, I did the concert with her. And we actually, I, she came back next year and I played for That's how I handled it. I mean, I will be polite, but no one's going to treat me like that. I will not allow it. I was courteous and professional. 
but you know there is a limit and no one's going to walk on me in other words you back me into a corner you might get bit <laughs> so that that but you know but no i um i i feel i feel i i i like a company but i give the the soloist i have i have a young student right now he's got a full scholarship for his master's degree he's a marvelous baritone i'm mentoring his career you know and if i'm still his teacher if he does something that's way off i'll say no you that's you need to fix that but if someone comes in and they know what they're doing i will go with it a lot of times in college you understand someone's accomplice would get sick and i would walk on stage and sight read that performance with no rehearsal okay so all i did said you just you know there was there was a time uh we did the mozart concerto for three pianos the crucial 242 the logic the first pianist got sick there was no rehearsal i went in and i literally read it off the score I just told I just told the other two pianists I said, just make sure you count, and we were and we were fine. So you know I'm 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 pretty flexible. I don't tell people it has to be this way. Right, you're not you're not okay. a, you're not you're not prescriptive. You just you just you just want to make sure that it's done right. Well, okay, I understand. I had one student that almost had a nervous breakdown trying to sound exactly like me. He couldn't do it. I told him, I said, you're not me and I'm not you. You're not going to, do I play exactly like my teacher? No, I don't. I'm not him. He's not me. But he liked what I did. You, you can't be somebody else. Yes. And that's you, a waste. That's a waste of time. They, they already are. They already are who they are. Why, why do you want to bother with that? Well, no, you, what you do is you take what the composer gave you, you add your own interpretation to it and you send it out to the audience. Right. It's a collective of the record. That's that's how it works. Yes. No one no one could duplicate me if they tried. It's impossible. They're not me. So I tell them, don't even try. Yeah. I never try to duplicate anybody else. Yes. Do I have my teacher's sound and tone? Yes, I do. But you know, our interpretation is exactly the same. You can you can play something that I played and something he played, and there's gonna there's gonna be some differences. Yes. Obviously. Yes, yes. Well you're, that's, you're two different people. That's that's inevitable. That's right. So that that's how I basically look at it. I mean, I give the students chance to, but they have to be within certain limits. You can't be, yes. the tempo can't be drunk. I mean, I mean, things have to be done within a certain parameter. But I give them a parameter. They have a, you know, they have a football field, not a not two not two inches of ground. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. I, I I understand. I understand. But you know, and that's I think a lot of a lot of organists don't like what Cameron Carpenter does because he takes dramatic liberties with. Things like registration and, you know, and um, well, you know, I if you if you heard some of my registrations, you you would, I mean, they're very unusual, but you know, I usually don't get any complaints though. Right, right. You know, I, I hear the I hear the organ like a, I know a lot of times. Sometimes I, I would go into someone's church and sub. I, I one time this person got sick, and it was a it was a weekday service. And I said, okay, I'll go in and play. So I went in and played the organ, and when I when I when I was walking out. The, the usher said, okay, when did the church buy a new organ? I said, oh, did you get a new organ? He said, well, I said, well, I'm not sure how to answer that. He said, well, he said, between Sunday and now, the church bought, I said, no, it's the same organ as you've had before, all, all along. Just he said, it. well, what did you do to it? I said, well, I just played it. He says, well, it doesn't sound like that when the other person plays. I said, well, you'll have to take that up with them. I refuse to make any cut. So when he called me back, I said, how did it go? I said, well, I think it went very interesting. Because <laughs> when he got back to church, everybody said, why can't you play like that? Right. You know, I, 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 I felt so bad. <laughs> yeah. I, I said, well, I just, it was a small organ. And, you know, there's, there's a thing you can do with hymns. If there's no two foot, you can put the 16 foot on and play up an octave for the hymns and it gives you a, a whole top that you, you know there's little things you can do to make the organ sound better and that's basically what i did right there, there, there was there, there was no there was no there was no clarinet stop so i took a one and three fifths one and a third two and two thirds and put the flute on made a clarinet so just this little stuff like that he probably didn't think about so i, I just kind of invented as i learned yes yes well that's that's great i mean that's 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 wonderful um yeah, and and you know, and it's it's interesting because a lot of people uh, don't realize that the organ is actually, in fact, the world's first synthesizer, because that's 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 actually what it is. You're you're working with tones to to create other tones. So just yes. like just like on a synthesizer, you would use a, a wave, a sine wave, and a saw wave, for example, to create the sound yeah. of perhaps a violin or a, or a cello. Well, you know. Well, right. Well, so, exactly. And, and, and there's and there's an art to that registration. There's an art to to, to register. I mean, 
that I don't think people understand that ju just, uh, you know, playing the organ is the, the last thing you have to worry about is the keys. I mean, yeah, you know, if you have a bad registration, it doesn't matter what you play. No, exactly. Exactly. Or well, Hammond organ, I, I, I figured out using the harmonic system, how to make read stops and all kinds of stuff just by just by using the overtone series. You know? Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and, and you know, um, I think I think. Yeah, well, you know, I made I made this contention, you know, that the, that the organ is the world's first synthesizer and, and, and is a form of additive synthesis. And uh, and I got into well, I got into a bit of an argument, a disagreement with uh, with uh, Cameron Carpenter, because he said anybody that claims that the organ is a, is a synthesizer is an idiot. So anyway, I, I you know, I, yeah. I, I, you know, I, well, yeah, so, and well. I mean, these are these, these are the kinds of disagreements that sometimes I get into because, you know, you know, it's like, you know, I'll deal with with people that that that, you know, have a very contrary opinion. And that's fine. I, do, I don't mind. You know, if you want to have a contrary opinion, you're entitled to your opinion. But sometimes so, sometimes facts are facts and it doesn't matter what your opinion is. You know, it just matters what to, what what the well, sometimes sometimes you have to agree to disagree. That's also true. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. In, in diplomatic terms. Yes. Agree to disagree. And that's it's that you leave it at that. Exactly. Yes. Precisely. Yeah. And I think I did that. I, I didn't, I didn't get into it. You know, I just, I said, okay, it's good to know, you know, just left it. Well, there. you know, you know, when I, when I was a young musician and, and the musicians were older and more famous than me, yeah. if I didn't agree with something, I kept my mouth shut. Because, and, and, and you know what I discovered 20 or 30 years later is that they actually were right. You know, I just had the, you know, the brashness of youth, you know, so I after, afterwards, you know, one one teacher said to me, "Okay, thirty years from now, you can look at this differently." You know, and I went back to that person thirty years ago and apologized and said, "You know, you're right. You were right all along." But I, I, you know, I, I figure that person knows more about it than I do. I keep my mouth shut. Right. So this kind of deference to, to people that are more senior in terms of establishment or practice, or well, for example, when, when I was when uh, the concert, one of the concert masters of the Detroit Symphony was one of my mentors. So when a famous pianist would come, he would make sure I got an interview with that person in the green room. So I met, you know, every famous pianist that came to Detroit. You know, and when they would, when they gave an opinion, you know, like when Rudolf Serkin said something on Beethoven interpretation, I'm sitting like an open my mouth and disagree. Who am I, who am I, this 20 year old kid to, to disagree with Rudolf Serkin, you know? I, I didn't, I kept my mouth shut. When my teacher, Miss Chicago said something, you did not disagree with him. You, you'd be kicked out of the studio. Whatever it was, I kept my mouth shut. And 99% of the time, he was right. But he did not allow any, it was all very autocratic. He was, you know, Russian, you know, from Kiev. And it was the old Russian school of teaching piano. And that was it. You did, do what I told you, you're out the door. You know? I told people, we probably throw you out the window and fall over the Steinway. <laughs> so I, I, you know. When I when I grew up, I didn't say much. I just I, I was like a sponge. I just took all this in. Then later on, I sorted it out, and what was worth keeping, I kept. And then, you know, I just got rid of the rest of it. When someone tells me something, I'm, my first reaction may be, "Oh, that's garbage." But then I'll think about it later on. Think, well, okay, maybe it would, you know, I, I give someone the benefit of the doubt. I guess that's what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and that's that's a courtesy. That's a courtesy that not everybody extends. Well, again, you know, none of us are gods, and we don't have the last word on everything. You know, and and, and I, to to, uh, to a colleague of mine who was very who was very rude to someone that, a couple of weeks ago, I said to him, "Oh, I walked by and said, he who acts like a king usually ends up getting crowned." <laughs> and I just. That's all I said when I walked by and he stopped like that. So, you know, you, you have to be careful what you say. You know? if, if, you, if, you, if you see my sites, you notice I don't comment on anything. I really don't. I post the things. And a lot of the, a lot of the scores I posted for my students to read, you know, so maybe they're not the kind of, maybe the, I wouldn't agree with the performance totally, but it gives them score reading practice. Maybe it was the one I wouldn't have chosen my own personal library. But there was a, there was a purpose for it because there was a score where the person could follow the score, and I tell them that my staff performance is not the one I would choose, and then take it with a grain of salt, maybe the whole salt line. Mm -hmm. But but you need you need the score reading practice. You know what I'm saying? So that, that that's kind of how I do it. Yeah. 
Um, are you familiar with the artist Jacob Collier by any chance? I've heard the name. Yeah, he's a he's a he's an English chap, uh, twenty five or twenty six, I think. Uh, okay. And and uh, he does he does things with harmony that are just that that boggle most musicians' minds. Um, okay. You know, but yeah, he's a, he's a interesting interesting fellow, um, and uh, he created this harmonizer with with a, a collaboration with MIT. Where you know he can sing one note and then play play the keyboard and it'll sound like a whole choir. So he can basically reharmonize on the spot. Um, well, and one okay. of one of the pieces that he performed, uh, you know, he was playing a MIDI keyboard and the and what he played on the keyboard was translated into a live musical score on people's iPads. So he was basically playing the orchestra live. Okay, that, that's good. You know, between LinkedIn and Facebook, I think I've got close to eighteen thousand people right now. So it's it's really hard to keep up sometimes. I get about 200 emails. So I just, you know, just people, you know, I, I can't I can't live on the computer every day. I don't have that kind of time. I, I go on in the morning, go on at night. So I just kind of skim through and do the best I can. You know, I try to I try to catch birthdays. I try to, you know, do that. And if I get behind, I put one of my apprentices on. They're all computer users. And I just let, I just let them do that. Well, you know, when I grew up, we didn't even have calculators. Yes. There was no such thing. Computer. We didn't. We didn't have calculators. You know, I went to school in the fifties. You know. So I, I just, I just tell my apprentices here. You know, you take care of this for me. You wish, you wish happy birthday. You do all this stuff. Cause I just don't have time today to do it. Yeah. yeah. I make it. I make. I make it sixty birthdays in one day between LinkedIn and Facebook. Yeah. No, that's that's ridiculous. I mean, yeah, you couldn't be expected to keep up with that. No, I, I really can't because you know you when you teach, you, when wouldn't, you're, you wouldn't have time for anything else. When you teach 40 students a week in two in three days and you practice four to six hours a day and you have a church position where you're coming up for a big pump sunday concert and then you have to sleep and do everything else there's really no time for anything yeah yeah what do you have do you even have time to go to the toilet of course <laughs> That's, i well, i think that would be rather necessary yes yes of course i that was that was a bad joke but but you know i mean it's like it's like you know when you're so busy it's like it's it's you you almost I don't know. It become it becomes really difficult because you you know um, you. I, I, I literally meet myself coming and going, and when I'm very grateful at my age, I can still do anything I can do when I was twenty, and I can still move as fast as I could when I was twenty. So I I haven't slowed down. My my doctor tells me I'm going to make it to about a hundred between one hundred and six and one hundred and twenty. He says you'll still be as just as fast as you are right now because your body checks out at thirty five years of age. Yeah, that's amazing. That's that's really great. So, so I'm still, what's 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 your secret? Is 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 it is it is it, a, is it a, an elixir of life, or are we are we dealing with a a strange tonic made by French monks? What's what's your what's your secret? Okay, well, well, first of all, I do everything natural. I, I don't take any medications of any kind. I do vitamins, and all my vitamin regime. I go to the chiropractor regularly. I do what they call I do what they call cryotherapy. You know what cryotherapy is? Oh yes, oh yes, yes. Very. I know. I, I, I do that every other week, and then uh, tomorrow I go for a deep tissue massage. Yes. And, you know, and I, I, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I live a healthy lifestyle. I, I, my weight is where it's supposed to be. I live on 2,000 calories a day. I'm careful what I eat. I get as much rest as I can. That's, that's the secret of being healthy. That's, that's what I do. All right. Well, well, now, now we know that it's not a, a strange tonic made by, by, you know, by a witch, no. by, 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 by a witch in a cauldron, you know, in a, no. in a, in a small <laughs> hut in the south of France. No, it's nothing like that. It's just called, it's called using good common sense with you. Know. And, and, and you try to keep your stress level down, you know. Ah, yes, that's very important. And you keep your, and you, if your body's stressed out, it doesn't heal. So I keep my stress level down because, you know. A lot of things people get upset about, I don't even, I, I just tell them, I said, why are you getting upset about this? It's not even important. I said, civilizations we know is not going to end if that doesn't happen right now. Yeah, putting you know. it all in perspective. Well, I always tell people too, you know, you get, the, you get these young students and of course they're in, they're, they've got some female that's the beginning and all and end all. And I tell them, I said, look, I said, your life does not start and end with another person. I said, understand that. Don't put all your eggs in one basket because when you break up with them, you're going to be a basket case for weeks. And I said, you've got, you've got your studies. You've got far more important things to be doing than that. 
to keep your priorities straight. That's what I tell my students. You know, yes. so, so I tell them, I said, you know, I said, I said, you know, you, I said, you know, the college does not offer a course on Asininity 101. So I said, you, you have to take that course, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, look, if 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 your career as a pianist ever ever you know ever dries up, you 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 have a career in comedy waiting. Oh, really? Well, thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes. The, this kind of yeah, this kind of dry acerbic humor. I think. I, well, it's it's my favorite kind of humor anyway. And and okay. uh, the the Brits tend to enjoy it. You know that you know, it's it's not your humor is not very American, but I like that. I that's that's you know, that's okay. Well, well, I'm not very American either, even though I am. I, I'm probably mid-century, you know, mid-19th century Viennese, if you get down to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, having a having the high IQ I do, I can be very witty and I can be very sarcastic very nicely if I if I so inclined to do. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, thank you so much for this, and and uh, you You're know, welcome. my pleasure. Know. And uh, yeah, and and I look forward to you know to listening to more of your recordings. You know, I I've been I I've been uh, I've been listening to quite a few of them. And uh, and actually, that's 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 how I initially reached out to you is because I I was you know on YouTube as one as one is you know just going through different videos of people playing things and I came across your video. I listened to it and I was like, I've got to connect with this person. Okay, well, thank you. Well, well I, I'm my on my on my website on my website. There's twelve. Uh, there's 12 what they call encore recordings I just put on there. So that's on there. And there's also four videos at the end when I improvise from given melodies. You might enjoy those. So if you want to check those out on the website. I'm, I have, I'm going to be doing some recording when COVID settles down and I can travel and, and you know, so do so. Mm -hmm. But I'm doing it in the meantime, I'm just getting, I'm getting prepared to do the recording sessions. Yes. Well, you know, um, speaking, speaking as, a, as a producer and sound engineer, uh, I would mm. say that given the way you play, uh, you might want to consider a pair of stereo ribbon microphones and nothing okay. else. A, okay. pair of, a pair of XY stereo ribbon microphones, you know, and, and just, just have them, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I think that'll do wonders for, for the, you know, the way that you play. Okay, well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And in a small hall, you, you want, you know, ribbon microphones tend to work better in, int in intimate situations. Okay, okay. I'll keep that in mind. Yes, yes, certainly. So yeah. Anyway, uh, it was great talking to you, and uh, and uh, yeah, and and I'll stay in touch. Please do. Okay. Take care. You too. Thank you. Bye now. <laughs>